I was going to do the Bluetooth version, but then, you know, we don't, we don't want that shit. Exactly. We, the wires look cool, too, because it's a conversation starter. That's the best part of having wires. You can conversationalize that and be like, hey, you're wearing wires. Like, do you also feel the same way? Like the same thing with our friend Andrew when he was wearing the wired earbuds. I'm like, hey, man, I wear wired earbuds. Any particular reason you do? He's like, yeah, actually, there is. And that kind of stuff, I love to find a connection with people from random observations because it's like about them. It's not just like a cold approach of like, hey, do you like the weather today? It's like, no, this is about you. This is an observation about you versus just coming in there and just raw dogging it and just mentioning anything random. But people love talking about themselves. So it's like, oh, actually, yeah, I do do this for a reason. And this is why. And you get excited because it's something that you're curious about as well. They also get the they get the proof that you notice something about them that they care about. It's not sure. something boring. It's something that they spend time doing. So for example, when I was wearing the nasal strips, right? You said right away, it's a conversation starter. Yes. And I didn't think of that. I was like, I didn't even, I didn't even, I didn't even contemplate that it's a conversation starter. But you look, hmm. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice to have a world where you didn't need conversation starters? Like, why couldn't you just go up to a person and say, what are, what are your thoughts on Dostoevsky? Right away. Hey, what do you think about, like genuinely though. <laughs> Instead of the weather, not trying to, Dostoevsky. <laughs> huh? Instead of the weather, you just talk about Stoicism right. and, and different philosophers and you just go into this deep conversation of their beliefs on life. Yeah. How they view yeah. living. Or like uh, you could go up to someone and say, hey, uh, why do people still drink Coca-Cola? I don't get it. Like genuinely, right? And this, this is one of the questions I wanted to ask you. I wrote this down. What, what is it about, and, and you can look at it from your life too. There are certain times when we do really stupid things, but we are not aware of them. Right. So, for example, me and my family, we would eat at like Long John Silver's. I don't know if you know this. Restaurant. I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. It's classic. It's damn good. <laughs> damn good restaurant. Like deep fried chicken. Yeah, right? seafood stuff, too. Yeah. They had seafood and French fries and all this. And then Jack in the Box, Whataburger, McDonald's, like all the time. Wendy's. I worked at Wendy's. So I ate a lot of Wendy's. So. And then later on in life, we sort of realized that these foods are causing harm to our health. So what is the, the transformation that we got lucky to have? Because I, I count myself very lucky that I'm not still drinking Coca-Cola because I may not even think that Coca-Cola is the problem. I may not even think that you know, conventional meat tacos are the problem. Right. Or, or, or the dirty water is the problem. So is there a time when a man starts giving a fuck about his health like a rite of passage almost about giving a fuck what health. was yours mine mine never became a rite of passage in the sense of i had someone take me under their wing like a father figure like a lot of ancestral um groups of people would actually go and when they're 13 they would just go out into nature and their dad would be like okay son it's time for you to go into nature you might run into some stuff that are that is going to kill you you might have to you know we will definitely have to go f get your own food kill your own animals cook your own food figure out how to make a fire and of course the dad's going to help teach these things but there's only so much that the dad can teach before the person does it in real life for me there wasn't much of a expression of that sense there was a couple times in Boy Scouts where I did go out into nature and live on my own and like spend the night in, you know, <laughs> just making a shelter for myself and just being like, okay, this is how I'm going to spend the night. But it was only one night. It was super easy because it was like, okay, this is fine. Like people know where I am. I feel safe. Like there's no threats around me. It's okay. Versus people and other, um, especially older and more developed um, communities of tribes, they would just be like, all right, go off and do your thing. Mm. For me, I feel like societally we assume college is like that because people are like, hey, let's go to college and that's going to make you a man. That's going to make you a woman. And you go there and you have a lot of things taken care of. Your food, 
your, your housing, your board, all these things you're taking care of. The only discomfort you have is exams and examinations and having to stress yourself out in order to fit in with your peers, to try new things, to join clubs, to make friends. That's a whole different psychological side that I needed in college because I was missing that side because a lot of the connection I had was through people that I would just grow up with and be near. But when I went to college, it was a fresh start. And it was also a sense of figuring out how to check my ego, which I think a lot of people are so accustomed to just taking with them their whole life. And then when I went to college and I had this ego of like, I'm better than everyone because I don't drink. That was like my big mindset in college. I literally decided to go to the, the health and wellness floor freshman year. I was like seeking this floor as a person that wanted to be around people who were like at the time feeling like they're better than everyone because they took care of their health. So I first went to college and experienced that. And most people think of college as I'm going to go there and, you know, get hammered and, and study and, and meet girls and all these things. And I was thinking of college of like, I want to meet some weird people like me. And I didn't, but I tried to. So that was my first take on, okay, how can I be around these, these kind of people and find someone to go under their wing, right? Because my family, just like you were saying, which by the way, I had no idea you worked at Wendy's. That's definitely an interesting new fact that I learned about you today. But with myself, I didn't ever have a person that was like, hey, this is what health is. And I didn't get that until high school where I had a high school teacher who piqued my interest about health and he was a gym teacher. And he basically, the joke for him was he taught honors gym. And we called him Mr. D. His name was, it was Glenn. He was actually the person that got me into CrossFit when I was in high school because he started a CrossFit gym outside of school. But he was the first person that made me like question what we were doing with food and what was happening. And I learned about the paleo diet, of course. And that was my first experience. But at the time, it was all ego. I was like, how can I get better than everybody else? I had really bad skin too. So I was like, how do I improve my skin through diet? That was the first time I associated diet and skin. And then I talked to my esthetician, who's actually very smart and wasn't just a dermatologist who just prescribed things and just told you that, you know, whatever you had was hormonal and you just need to deal with it and take these drugs. She was actually a very well-trained esthetician who would work on facials. And she ended up telling me, oh, you don't need to worry about diet. And in my head, I was like, for some reason, that feels wrong. Like, this is an authority figure in my life who I believe a lot in because they really have an astounding sense of um, realization and how to take care of your skin. But for her, it was all about skincare. And for me, it was like, I've been doing skincare for two, three, four years, and my skin is still a mess. So what else is there that I need to do in order to improve my skin? It's got to be something else. And then after years of discovery, it turned into my gut. But to go back to your first point, it was my high school gym teacher who opened my eyes to health in a sense of like, I can do something about this. But at the time it was all ego. So it was like, I want to be better than everybody. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do these things. And it wasn't until college when I realized that nobody gives a shit. And <laughs> it was very like tough on me to be like, oh man, these kids are, you know, I'm seeing these kids who are, have this high status because they're, you know, sports players, I went to a really hockey focused school, up, you know, close to Montreal. And a lot of the kids that were like, high status at the school were hockey players. No one cared about what they ate. No one cared about um, as much even like what they looked like. They just cared about, oh, these kids are good at the sport and they have a lot of talent in the sport. So therefore they are people that are, you know, doing well in the school because they have success in this sport, which is important to everyone at the school because hockey was everything at that school. It was the division one hockey school. So I was like, damn it. Like I thought I was going to be healthy and that was going to make me stand out. And now no one cares, but I still want to do it. And that was what allowed me to pursue health in a way that was more internalized and not an expression of trying to be better than everyone else. Mm. The thing you said about trying to do health because you want to prove someone wrong or to prove yourself right, because you want to be, you want to tell everyone that, hey, I'm better than you because I don't drink alcohol. This mindset of... It's, it's sort of the means to the end, right? So if you take a look at some very famous people like Michael Jordan, right? Michael Jordan's goal was to be 
someone that his dad loves, right? Because there were two brothers. Michael Jordan's big brother was playing baseball. Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan himself wanted to also get loved by his dad. So he started playing baseball. But what happened was his, his older brother was just way better than him at baseball, way right. better. So the older brother got all the love. But then what happened is Michael tried to other, play other sports too, like basketball. And when he started becoming really good at basketball, he, he started getting love from his dad. It's like, oh, his dad started attending the games. So, and, and this is not just Michael Jordan. This is the case with Kobe Bryant. May not be a dad thing, but even Kobe Bryant, you know, he gets angry and he's like, I want to destroy people, right? Michael Jordan would insult people. I don't know if you've seen The Last Dance, which is a Netflix movie, a documentary on in the entire Michael Jordan career. All of his, his, cla his uh, classmates, his teammates were saying, Michael Jordan was a savage. Like he would insult me to try to make me play better. So Michael Jordan also had a means to an end, mm -hmm. right? It was like, how can I get love from my dad and kill it in basketball and become the best in basketball? Maybe that is a starting point. But then his competitive nature, right? His genetics, his upbringing, where he was in life sort of made all of that like the perfect storm and then made him the best basketball player ever, you know, the GOAT. So relating that to Michael Jordan, right? You needing a perhaps egotistical reason, an insecurity reason to become healthy. Is that forgivable? Is that fine? Is, is that something you would recommend let's say to your future son or to your little brother or to your cousin or to one of your clients who you coach is is it do you, is there a pure enough reason to do something to improve your health because a lot of guys they improve their health to get girls right or to not get made fun of or to be confident in the bedroom, confident to take your shirt off at the gym, right? What, or, or, or not at the, at the gym in Mexico, but like, <laughs> like at, the, at the pool, at the beach, and so on. Um, or, or to be able to wear fashionable clothes, right? Tight-fitting clothes. So is there a pure reason to do something in, for our health and well-being? Or it doesn't matter what the reason is, just get the job done. I wonder how much of that ties into my shadow work because my shadow was in the same mindset of fragility and needing to prove myself, needing to be better than others and needing to feel entitled about things because of the way I lived, which was between my own health with women. There was a lot that my shadow has to do with those feelings that I've developed throughout my childhood and my teenage years and my early adult life that have tied into this awareness that I've been just able to scratch the surface of with empathy and love and compassion and being able to come from love and start at love. But I have the same question. I'm always wondering if I was that kind of compassionate person younger, which I knew I was, I felt that compassion, but I didn't have nearly as much of a understanding of why I was doing things. And my motivation was never compassion. It was for me, it was egotistical. It was trying to be better. It was trying to prove others wrong that I could be okay and fit in and do better than others, whether it be through activities or through how I looked and how I performed. And honestly, the one thing that kind of grounded me at first through this process was not being better than others. Like, realizing that even if I put all this effort in, there are people who are still going to be better than me and they don't put any effort in. They, they, they put effort in with like their training maybe or something else, but the things I'm focusing on, like my diet and my regimen and my focus on my skincare and my focus on my ingredients, I still didn't perform as well as they did in certain sports. I didn't perform as well as they did academically. Maybe one or the other, right? Usually not both, which I kind of took with a little bit of pride. And then when I would meet someone rarely who was smarter and more athletic than me, I was like, damn it. Like, what do I have over this person? Like, mm. I'm trying to make sense of it in my head because I want to feel good about myself versus being compassionate about that person 
and their journey and not being in my own head about, oh, I put all this work in. Now this person's better than me. That's when I realized that that whole system isn't going to work because it makes me doubt myself too much because I'm doing it for external reasons. And those external reasons aren't making sense because they change. People change. Maybe someone didn't want to date me and I had no idea why and they wanted to date someone else. And I was like, this guy doesn't even like look like me or this guy doesn't do this or do that. Why do they want to date him? And realizing that, well, I can't control other people. I can't control their feelings on this. So I have to figure out why I want to do something and why it feels good to me and stick to that versus taking else, taking on someone else's beliefs and taking on someone else's validation in order to really validate myself, which comes a lot from parental figures, my mother, my mm -hmm. father, being able to prove to them that I am good enough in school, that I am good enough as a person, luckily, or maybe unluckily, my parents were really huge about me succeeding in athletics. They didn't really care as much. They wanted me to succeed in academics and they wanted me to protect myself in sports. So I was never put in any contact sports. It was always sports that were for endurance and for training. And I was never in a position where my parents were very upset or mad if I didn't do well in sports. With academics, it was, you know, this is everything. My parents are academics, so this is very important to them. But with sports, it was never, oh, man, you lost? What a loser. Like, you you suck. Like, you, you, you should have won that, but you missed up. It was always, oh, you did great, son. It's okay. It's okay you struck out and you were the last one. You know, it's okay that you, you missed the last goal and therefore the whole team lost. Like, it doesn't matter. You just had fun. That's the important part, right? So there was never that sense of, like, needing to validate myself athletically. And it didn't come in until I started realizing that I wanted to be in physical shape and I wanted to look good physically that I would manifest this athleticism. And it was funny because when I started taking effort into sports and I focused in on CrossFit, which allowed me to look the way I wanted to with the expense of really putting my body through the ringer with things that I do not feel proud of and do not want to put my body through the ringer with, I ended up realizing that my friends were just more athletic than me in certain activities and just finished workouts faster than me sometimes and were stronger than me in certain lifts. And I was like, what the heck am I going to do about this? Like, why, why is this so important to me? And it became this grudge I had against people and it shifted into compassion. It shifted from hate and fear and jealousy into compassion, being like, I love my friends and I know their diet isn't perfect and I'm not going to be like, but I do this and they're better than me. I switched it to I'm loving my friend for just being themselves and being able to express themselves and take care of themselves in the best way they are able to and they know to instead of feeling entitled about having to be someone better than them because I put in the work. Mm -hmm. And that is when I went within and didn't externalize all these feelings that I needed to validate myself through health because health is a, is a self journey and it's not about not being sick or not being in pain or those are all very important things, but I think it really becomes a practice of self-love. Tell me, you mentioned shadow work, mm. right? And shadow is, is something that we learned from Carl Jung, right? As you know, the shadow is, is this other part of you that's not personality. It's something that you're hiding, something that you really want to do. It's your dark side and you can't express it because... The world doesn't let you express it for whatever reason. People will laugh at you or shame you. Um, you may have childhood trauma, so you may not be able to do those things. Whatever that is. And then you also mentioned earlier that certain cultures have a rites of passage. Right. Right. So the Vikings, the Native Americans, many, many cultures have this. Right. I'm sure the Maasai have this too. And so... The rites of passage that allow someone, and even like the bar mitzvah, right? The Jew, Jews have it. So, quinceanera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know what quinceanera. What is that? It's the Spanish. The, I think it's fifteen when you turn fifteen in, in Mexico. The, I think it's Mexico and wow. maybe other Latin American Quincinera, countries. Quinceanera, quince, fifteen. Quinceanera. Quinceanera. But it's a very big deal here. It's yeah? like a sweet sixteen for the U.S. Ah, and it's for men and women. I believe. Or men I only. think it's for women, but okay. I have no, I've only seen women celebrate it. Like the sweet Maybe 16. Maybe men do something else. Yeah. Equivalent. Yeah. Got it. Like men yeah. don't have sweet 16. They're no. just like, it's a little bit different for them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's very interesting. So, so what I wanted to ask you, Jameson, is that if we don't get a rites of passage as we are going from one age to the next or one 
sort of adolescent to adulthood, childhood to adolescence, then is this sort of the reason why we have to do shadow work? Like, p- people who do have proper rites of passage and do properly get their sexuality expressed, they marry at the right age, they have children at the right age. Like, I'll give you a simple example. One of the guys we recently hired in Afro D, very, very recently. Awesome guy, really, really awesome guy. Looks younger than me. He has a 16 year old, right? I have no kids. I'm not married. And, and, and this guy was, you know, he, he was talking about, I have to go and, uh, you know, put, uh, 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 say good night, good night to my kids. Mm-hmm. So he would like take a break and then we'd cut, jump back on the Zoom meeting. And I'd be like, oh, it's probably three year old, <laughs> two year old baby. And then last call, he's like, yeah, by the way, uh, my, my son, he just turned 16. So I'm buying him a new car. So I have to go make sure that the car, I was like, what? 16? So he probably got married when he was, or, or had kids when he was like 22, 23, mm-hmm. right? So, and then, and obviously we know Freud talked a lot about this stuff where if you don't go through the sexual stages in a normal way, whatever that is, then you will have problems later on in life. So from your experience, the lack of rites of passage, if that is why you now have to do shadow work or what you have this concept of shadow work, which I bet the Maasai in, uh, in, in Sudan or in Kenya, they don't have shit like that. Exactly. Right? So, so first at, t- tell me if that is, that could be a, a proponent of that. And second question, what do you do for shadow work? Cause I know we do cold plunges together. We do right. breath work. Right. We do a lot of, nature walks we we've done a lot of things together but what do you specifically do today and have done in the past so someone who doesn't even know what shadow work is or why it's beneficial they would learn a lot from that yeah shadow work at its roots are egoic because it's about you it's about you trying to express something and feeling a validation by doing an activity that helps grow you in some way or another for your future by dealing with your past and dealing with your present moment and being in an uncomfortable place. But like you said, with these ancient tribes, how they have been able to just naturally fall into that and they notice maybe when they're on a a tribal um, retreat of sorts and you're out there in the forest and back in your, you know, village, you think you have all these responsibilities and there's a need to live up to this expectation. And maybe you feel like you need to be the most athletic and the best and the best looking. And then when you're in the woods, you're like, okay, back to Maslow's hierarchy. All you need to do is find shelter and take care of yourself and stay alive for the night. Like you just want to be able to stay alive versus worrying about this need to be the best that you can be and proving all the other people wrong or right, depending on how they view you. And when you're in those primal settings, you don't really have to think about as shadow work as a, as a thing to mentally masturbate about and to use as an excuse because it comes to you in ways where you have to face things and face demons and face things in your head that you probably don't have to face if you're in a comfortable situation. So that's probably why it's not such a commonality. And it also isn't something you have to tell people. You need to face shadow work before you become a man. You need to look into your shadow and that's what's going to make you a man. I think there's a lot of men that need the shadow work and it's an activity and a lifestyle change that they need to look into if they're dealing with issues but there's also a lot of men in, in tribes and in different lifestyles where they have maybe some men are, you know, 10 years old and they have to take care of their three year old, four year old, five year old brother and sister because their parents are working all the time. Like there's things that you just don't even get to kind of understand at that level because you don't have an ego that's telling you you need to do shadow work yet. Or you have a shadow that you need to face the shadow. It's more of just, OK, this is what's needed of me. And this is what I will do because this is what I need in order to stay alive, keep my family alive. This is what I need to do. This is how I need to take care of things. So there's a lot of mental masturbation with shadow work. And it's an easy excuse, right? It's an easy fallout to be like, oh, this is my shadow. So I'm not, you know, it's it's almost an excuse in my opinion. And that being said, it's still very important because we give it a name and it's something that we should look into. But it should also never be like, oh, I did that because I never faced my shadow yet. 
oh, I did that because I'm still working on my shadow. And that's something that I had to come to terms with of pushing things down because they just were uncomfortable versus trying to be a better person because it just was the right thing to do. So with my personal journey, I knew about shadow work from group coaching with you. I had no idea it existed. I did not know that shadow work was a thing. I didn't know I had a shadow. I knew I had thoughts that were dark and thoughts that were anger and resentment and thoughts of, of fear and, and pain and putting people through hard times. But it wasn't something that I had a name with. And being able to learn about shadow work gave my ego an excuse to work on it because it was something that, oh, I can work on this. It's not easy, but it's there. And I need to work on what's happening in my life in order to improve my life. So of course I'm going to do this. And that's where the ego kind of comes in handy because it makes you do things that you normally wouldn't do unless you were in a situation where it just became to you naturally in life, which is why I don't believe that it becomes a necessary thing for everyone to be like, hey man, how's your shadow work journey going? Did you go through it? Did you not go through it? Do you know what it is? Because some people have and they have no idea what it is. And some people haven't and they definitely need to learn about it so that they can actually go through that. It reminds me of a story of a tribe of a, um, a lot of times where Christians were traveling the world to spread the message of Christianity. They would visit tribes and I'm not sure what the exact specifications of who was visiting who was, but there's a story I hear of this tribe was visited by these Christians and the tribe leader, somehow they could communicate. I don't know how, but the tribe leader asked the, you know, the crusader of sorts of so the person sharing the message of Christianity. And he said, so why do you tell me all these things? If I need to know this, why do you tell me? Because if you don't tell me these things, then I live my life as I normally do now. And I don't have this feeling of guilt or shame or regret. But now you're telling me that I need to know this. Is there a difference? Is it now that I do know that I have a problem versus if I didn't know, I would be ignorant to it. And therefore, I wouldn't have to worry about those you know, ailments. If you're talking about hell and talking about all this you know, stuff going on later on after life. That's going to happen to me if I don't live the way you tell me to live. But before living, was I also a sinner? Was I a person that was bad because I didn't know this? Or was I just living my life and ignorant to this? And they said, the crusader was like, well, you didn't like you didn't have to learn about before. But isn't it a beautiful thing? You can learn about this. This is so important for you. But they were like, I was living my life and living my life in the way I felt the most aligned with. And I had no idea what was happening and I didn't know any of these things and I was just living normally. But now that I know this, I'm in trouble. So why do you come to me and share this with me to put me in this predicament, put me in this sense of shame and guilt that I need to process now because of this information you brought to me? And that's how I feel about shadow work almost is this. If it becomes a thing that you need to do and that is everyone needs to look at, look at their shadow and everyone has a shadow because everyone has one. But it becomes something where it's easy to tell people they need to work on their shadow. And then they're like, I had like, I already vote. I, I, what do you mean? I already looked at my shadow. I've already gone through all these different processes when I was younger, but I had no idea that it was shadow work. Why are you telling me this now? So with my journey with shadow work, it was a little bit late for me in life. And I needed to figure out a few things. I needed to realize why I had these feelings and this resentment towards women, this resentment towards other people in the community, other men in the community that I just wanted to do harsh things to. I wanted to verbally abuse and make and really belittle uh, men and have this anger and resentment and this fire within me that really just wanted to be aggressive. And sometimes that comes out in ways that are very unhealthy, like screaming at people, yelling at your spouse, yelling at your children, yelling at your partner, yelling at people you care about and even getting to the point of physical abuse of other people around you, of your friends, of your community, of your neighbors. And there's this sense of, well, do I need to work on shadow work? Probably. But is that just telling someone they need to work on shadow work and fix their problems? Probably not, especially if they don't want to. Some people don't care. Some people are living a life where they just feel comfortable who they are and what they're doing. And they don't feel that need. They don't need that ability to go inside and to look for what's causing them all these issues. They just live their life. They beat their wife and it's not supposed to rhyme, but it happened to. And that's just the way that they are able to process why they're living. That's just how they were raised. And that's what makes sense to them. And when people tell them, Hey, you need to do your shadow work. 
they're like, but I'm living this life and I'm doing all these things. And I maybe sometimes they'll feel guilt. Maybe sometimes they'll know deep down they don't. Or sometimes they're just psychopaths and they don't care. And they just do this because that's all they know. And then when they're told to do shadow work, they, they find it laughable because they're like, I don't need to do that. I'm not going to partake in those things because I don't have to worry about my shadow. My shadow is good. So I think it's more of a subconscious agreement you have with your inner demons and your inner shadow that is the important part. And no matter how you get to that subconscious agreement, whether it be through not knowing about it as a child or learning about it as you're older through group coaching, you both, both ways you have that empathy and you have that compassion for others and you have that compassion for yourself and you have that ability of understanding how powerful you are as a man or a woman and what you have the ability to do, whether if it's manipulation, whether if it's strength and whether if it's pure grit and just being able to overpower people or to verbally abuse people, you know your capabilities and you don't shame yourself for those capabilities that you have. You just know to lead with compassion every time. When you were talking about this ignorance is bliss, right? The, with the Christian missionaries. Right. And so there is, a, there is a pain that I genuinely feel. And a, a lot of that pain, obviously, you know, the pain is mine. You know, I've put it in there. But it has been triggered by some things that you've told me. And I thank you for that because the, that pain is necessary and important. So one of those pains I felt yesterday as I was biking to the beach. So we went to the ruins yesterday and then we went to the beach right after. And one thought I had was, fuck, I'm going to get, I'm going to have to get an ethernet cable now, <laughs> right? For real. And the reason I had this thought is because yesterday we were talking about, or the day before yesterday, we were talking about. Uh, EMF, and you mentioned Ethernet cable because I sent you a link for that router, you know, for the Wi-Fi signal boost. Um, so the the pain was like, fuck, I am living my life. I'm not affected by Wi-Fi. Like, there's Wi-Fi everywhere. I'm good. Like, I'm in the present moment. I'm breathing through my nose <laughs> as much as I can, Right. I'm, you know, thank God living a great life with great people around me in a great relationship, great parents, get to travel wherever I want, right? Talk to amazing people like you and work out with amazing people like you and, and, and share love. And now I have to worry about this fucking ethernet, <laughs> right? Like, and uh, I thought, it was, it was such a debate in my head, ge genuinely, man. Like it was, a, it was a, a fight between, it's like good and evil fight, right? Whereas one side, the evil side was like, you know what? You're good. Like you're, you're eating healthy. You're sleeping amazing, right? You're, you're, you have great energy throughout the day, right? You, you, you're, you're, your bedroom performance is fine. Like everything is good. Like, you know, man stuff. You share love with people. You connect with people. Now you have to get out of sort of see yourself from a third party view and say, oh, Farhan may be affected by EMF somehow. And like I was legit in, in, a, in, a, in, in problem because I was riding my bike and I had nature all around me. It was beautiful. Right, Martha was going in front and I was, you know, just, just being her bodyguard like always. And I was like, man, I'm in, I'm on this thing we call earth, this ball spinning around another ball. And, and, and it's like, I'm in such a beautiful place in the universe right now. Thank God I'm this. But now I have to worry about EMF. Right? And, and so this ignorance is bliss. To what level do you take it? Because I, I know we've talked about this with Andre too, where sometimes you mental masturbate so much mm -hmm. that the anxiety itself mm -hmm. will spike up cortisol to such a manner that the benefit won't even matter anymore, right? You can have the perfect EMF, but the amount of time you spend stressing over it right. was not worth it. Right. So my question is, 
where do you draw the line between this good and evil? You know, the Tao, where is this line? Yeah. Is this yin and yang line in this case for your life? And what would you recommend to someone who does mental masturbate about every little thing? You know, mm -hmm. how many bananas should I eat? Or like, there's uh, a lot of that, right? It's but there's also too. something important about water too, right? right? Like water is also a big one. Like right. you put me in a lot of stress with water. Yeah. Right? Like, should it be, um, what was it? Reverse osmosis. There was a, a, a ultraviolet filter, right? All of these things. So, I mean, this is sort of a selfish question because like, I want to know how I can deal with these thoughts. Of course. Where I can go the rest of my life and then die with Wi-Fi all around me. Right. Or not. Right. But then I had, a, had, a, had another point of view, right? From, from reading Marcus Aurelius, which I'm reading all the time, but right now I'm reading meditations, rereading. I try to read it every birthday. So I started January 20th and now it's what, almost a month that I've been reading it, three weeks. And in this book, a big proponent of Stoic philosophy is live by nature. Live to what is your nature. Do what is natural, right? If Tell someone that they're wrong, but then leave it to them mm -hmm. to decide if they want to follow you or not, right? He talks about these things. So the thing like with Coca-Cola, from reading Stoic philosophy, I've gained an understanding of, you know what? It's all right. He thinks he's doing the right thing by drinking Coca-Cola. He doesn't know that he's doing wrong. And that's okay. I will do my best to help my brother out as he is a part of me on, in this universe. He's a part of me. He's connected to me. So I'll help my brother out. But the decision is still his. So how do you draw the line between this? And how would you recommend someone deal with these thoughts of... Wanting to be in the present moment, but still being true to their nature. It's a great, great question. First two things that I think of are two titles to books. I believe David, David Hawkins, I believe, has two books. One is called Letting Go, and one is called Power Versus Force. A full transparency, I've only read Letting Go, but there is a nature of thinking about things and how they make you feel and how that affects your body, which we know scientifically. And now I think of my dad, whenever I tell him health things, whenever I told him health things growing up, he's like, I've been living this way this many years and I'm fine. You know, like I've been doing this and I'm fine. And like you said, with ignorance growing up, I would drink sodas. I would, I wouldn't know what to do. Like I would just hear things from maybe my parents would say, Oh, I, I shouldn't drink caffeine because I'm hyper. And then in my head, I'd be like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't drink caffeine because it makes me too hyper. But I had no idea, like, until they told me that. I didn't know that that was the reaction to those things. I didn't know that was going to change my health or my behavior. I just learned by my environment. So when it comes to having those feelings of mental masturbation and having this scenario where you're like, I got to get an Ethernet cable now. Like, why is this another thing I need to do? It comes at such a price of mental anguish and being in a mindset of, well, I want to be in the best scenario. I want to do everything right that I can. And now I'm so grateful to have all this knowledge of these different research papers and scientific literature that will allow me to do the best that I can to my ability. And a lot of this boils down to compassion and self-love. It gets very spiritual. It gets very hippie. It gets woo-woo because... A lot of the impact, just like placebo effect, has a mental bandwidth on your body and your system. And this book, Letting Go, talks about the ability to come to peace and the ability to come to understanding with things. So I personally had a friend that I was hanging out with a lot back in 2017, 2018, a very tough time in my life, trivial time, lots of self-doubt, but I was very deep in my health journey. And my friend would always talk about blessing his food. Now, he wasn't Christian but he was very spiritual. And he would talk about how important it was for him. He knew that he was told scientifically that eating this food was bad for him, right? Eating blah, blah, blah is going to be bad for him. And he sometimes involved himself in eating those foods. He enjoyed the taste of those foods and he enjoyed partaking in consumption of those foods. But what he told me was, oh, it's okay. I, I bless my food before I eat it. 
in his mind, he would hold space with the food. He would harmonize somehow or use some kind of focus with that food and just take a minute to appreciate that food, even if it was highly processed and from a factory and not from a farmer or from, you know, nature, as we know is a lot more natural to the system, he would feel okay about it. And it wouldn't spike his cortisol because he blessed his food. Now, if he forgot to bless his food, that would cause something where he'd mentally masturbate and be like, oh, shoot, I forgot to do this. Maybe he had a system where he, you know, needed to change that and he needed to figure out what was happening and he would do it afterwards and it'd be fine. But I've noticed that within myself. Sometimes I will stress about a situation and I will feel a negative thought. I'll think of something happening. You know, I'll wake up one day and be like, what if I get hit by a bus today and I can't use my legs, right? What if I get hit by a car today and I can't use my legs? And this big puddle of guilt and fear grows in my stomach. So when that happens, I literally sit with, sit with myself and I think of being healthy and moving around freely and being grateful for all my limbs and being in my body and being able to move freely and being grateful for everything that I have in life, whether whatever happens and feel that shift in my gut from fear and misery to bliss and this sense of peace. And that's, that's what I have to do. And luckily for me, those intrusive thoughts aren't every day, you know, every hour. So it's not like I have to sit in that transition, but for some people they are. For some people, they mentally masturbate so hard that they have to sit in that constant pit of fight or flight because everything they do has fear. They're like, oh, shoot, I didn't, I didn't eat my three bananas today. I, I need to eat another banana. And they can't stop thinking about that for the whole day because they were told they need to eat three bananas. They were told by some authority figure that they need to eat three bananas. And if they don't, then they're not going to get the benefits they're looking for. And if they eat four bananas, then they're going to get bad benefits. <laughs> they're going to get the same situation is going to happen. That's going to be bad for them. So the mental masturbation comes down to re reaction. And I think the literature and the science is very impressive and very beautiful because it allows us to see what works for most people. Because that's the best we have for science right now. There's no yes or no. People could do studies on Coca-Cola to find that, okay, Coca-Cola is not good for you. It causes this insulin spike. But you're never going to know 100% if it's actually good for you or not. You're never going to fully know if these things are bad for you. Even if you hate corporations and hate the chemical companies and the plastics and everything that is happening, you're never going to have 100% certainty. That's just the beauty of being a human being. You know, someone can tell you the sky is blue, but then they're like, what's blue? Do you know what blue is? How do you describe blue? And it's just like, oh, this is what blue looks like. But how do you know it's blue? Do you just know it's blue because that's what you're, that's what you're told. That's how your body perceives it. We can never know if Coca-Cola is going to be bad or good for us. I have a hunch it's bad for us because I don't feel good after I consume it. I don't like the way I feel when I do these things, but I have no idea. But I do know that if I drink, a, if I drank Coca-Cola, not only would I feel bad and I would feel my, my body would feel kind of sluggish or maybe I would be, oh, I'd be buzzed. Of course, I'd feel energetic. I'd be excited because I'd have this caffeine, this energy, but then also I would have a lot of guilt. A lot of people who are drinking Coca-Cola don't have that guilt. They just drink it because it tastes good and they like it and they're feeling good about it. Who knows what's happening with their organs? Maybe the you know high fructose corn syrup, as we know, is spiking the bejesus out of their, their liver and they're having to pump a bunch of insulin out and become pre-diabetic, whatever happens scientifically. Those things, are, those things are happening. That does happen. But the guilt and shame that low negative frequency or vibration, as, as a lot of people like to use the terms for, isn't going to be there for them because they enjoy that. And maybe they're overweight. Maybe they don't like the way they look. Maybe they have body shame. But they are doing these things because it is okay to them and they enjoy it. So when people are in that mindset and they're doing these things, they have Ethernet cables. A great, great, great example. When you have an Ethernet cable versus Wi-Fi, it's not going to make a huge difference. Even when my friend personally took me through these machines he had where you would, you know, attach yourself to a machine and then you would touch something. You would go, you would turn your phone from airplane mode to, you know, Wi-Fi and you would see the spikes. You would see this. Okay, this is a quantifiable change in my environment. What does this have an effect on me? Probably something. But does it? I don't know. Another thing he did was he had this pole that I held on to. And I was laying in my bed and it showed me how many volts of electricity were going through my body as I was laying in my bed and the importance of grounding and why you need to ground and be in a grounding mat versus 
being in a bed with electrical plugs and being next to a lot of electrical outlets and having those things turned on. And I saw that and I was like, ooh, this is something I can improve on. And in my body, in my gut, improving on that was fun. It was a fun thing for me to do. I was like, I liked that. I was excited about that. It wasn't as much of that, oh, I have this problem and this is going to fix it. It was, ooh, this is a way for me to get better. And this is a way for me to do something that's cool and allowing me to explore more about my environment and what impact it has on me. But it never became something that was, I have the worst back pains in the world. And if I do this, it will, it will fix it, which is a whole different type of mental masturbation. You know, the cause and effect, the placebo effect. I take this pill, this thing gets better. For me, it's never about fixing the issue. It's about feeling good and learning about something that I can improve on. So the feeling good part and the learning part provides me this dopamine, provides me this sense of accomplishment that I get addicted to. And that's why I love being able to use the Ethernet cable. Because not only is it a conversation starter, not only is it fun to have an Ethernet cable and people are like, oh, you use an Ethernet cable versus Wi-Fi because, you know, EMFs are potentially dangerous for us. But it's something that I feel like I accomplished. It's something that I put the effort in to make a conscious effort towards my health. And it's an act of self-love for me. But I know with my own personal body, I don't get affected by Wi-Fi. Maybe I do, but I don't notice it. I don't feel any different. Some days I'll feel bad. Some days I'll feel good. Perfect example, when I ate that moldy butter, knocked me out. I had such a bad headache. I was like, am I dehydrated? Like, what's the problem here? And I noticed it multiple times. And I was like, what is this issue? And then I look at the butter and it's got mold in it. I'm like, okay, that causes me to feel like shit. That was the X factor that made me feel so poor in my health the past two days. And that's why I can't, I, I didn't have this focus. I had this feeling of taking a nap. I had this feeling of my head was hurting. My head was just in pain. I was nauseous. I was like, ugh, I was just, just in discomfort. And that's such an easy cause and effect because it's there and it has this effect. But then people are eating blue cheese and they love it and it's full of mold and they don't care. And it doesn't affect them like that. And they think it's delicious. I used to eat blue cheese. I'm Italian. I loved blue cheese. You know, we had gorgonzola. It was so amazing. I'm afraid to eat blue cheese now because of, a, of situations with mold, because of being like, oh, shoot, I eat that mold. And I feel like crap. So there's that fear association with doing that with with blue. I, there's a reason I don't have Ethernet right now. It's not a top priority for me. It's a mental masturbation that makes me feel a hit of dopamine because I'm taking an action to improve my health. But it's not affecting my day to day life enough for me to have to do something about it right now. And I like to talk about it because it's interesting, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a boundary. There's a, there's a barrier to it. If I have an issue and an ailment that's causing me to have a misery in my life, I want to change that. If I have something that I've learned about that I know that may or may not improve my health or improve my environment in the long term, I want to partake in it because it feels good. It's exciting to share. It's exciting to talk about. It's exciting to do something that could be good for your health in the future. It's like experimenting with new diets. So when I mentally masturbate, I am doing it for a reason to enjoy myself and get dopamine and pleasure from taking progress and self-love. But when I do something that is, is um, hurting me and it feels bad, I don't do it because I want the dopamine. I don't do it because I'm like, this is going to feel like really cool to take this step in health. It's because I'm looking at it as I have this issue and I just want it to go away and I just want to feel better again. I just want to feel good and I just want this to not happen. I don't want to have a headache. I want to feel good. I don't want to be nauseous. I don't want my stomach to hurt. I just want to feel good throughout my day. And then that's a whole different mentality. That's a fear-based mentality versus something that is more of a uh, excitement. Like doing something to fix something is because I don't want to feel the way I'm feeling. Doing something to like an Ethernet cable that I think and most scientific literature leads to or shows that will improve my health in the long run and will make me feel better maybe slightly, maybe not even noticeably, is a dopamine hit, is a, is a feeling of self-love and pleasure. But I also practice self-love in, in nature. I practice self-love through my thoughts, through things that I can do every day that are free. That self-love is already there. I'm not trying to fulfill the self-love cup that I need to fulfill because it's already overflowing. 
with self-love. But I know that if I continue to do things like that, it keeps on feeling better. But it's not a problem. It's not an issue for me. It's not causing me ailments. Just like with us, with dust and with mold, you didn't notice that as much. I started to notice it because my throat would get irritated. And I noticed that my throat irritates myself. And it's not life or death. It's not like mold where it's like, I can't work. I can't be productive right now because my head hurts so much. And all I can do is just close my eyes and just sit down. And I know people that have migraines, who have issues, who are like, I just wish I can get rid of this. I don't know what to do. Just give me the pill. Give me whatever I need to do to get rid of this pain because it's, it is slowing me down and it is just making me really miserable in this moment. But there's certain things like dust that cause throat discomfort for me where I'm like, well, this sucks. I don't like having throat discomfort, but is it stopping me from working? No. Is it stopping me from being able to do what I want to do? No. But it's annoying and it's uncomfortable and I want to fix it. That's something that I feel like the air filters and the cleaning, that's just another act of self-love. But that's an act of self-love that comes with a shift in behavior. It comes with a noticeable change in my sense of health because I can tell that my throat feels better when I use an air filter, when I clean more often, when I check for mold, when I clean out the mold. I just can sense that shift in my behavior. But it's not life or death. It's not like, oh, shoot, I got to figure out that I lived with a house in a house. When I knew about mold, I had mold under my sink. And I was like, well, I don't know what to do about this. I used Clorox. I learned that that actually makes it worse. That irritates my throat more by using the Clorox to clean it off. And it's in the wood. So it just keeps on coming back every week. I had to clean every week, every week, every week. It was in my kitchen. And I would just notice that every time I cleaned it, my throat would irritate myself again. And then there were times where it didn't irritate me. I knew it was in there, but it didn't irritate me. I eventually covered it with tape and a plastic and a trash bag. But it was still there. And I live with it. I live with that for nine months. And I just was like, it's there, but what am I going to do about it? I don't have the capacity to take care of that right now. I can't go in there. All I can do is go in there, get out as much wood as I can, remove as much wood as I can, and then cover it with a plastic or a paper or a um, you know, big black bag that just covers it all up. But I, I knew it was there, and I had to come to terms with that because I had to be like, well, I can't let this ruin my life. I can't move out. I can't go. I'm not going to go homeless because of this mold, you know, because that's not going to solve my problem. I'm going to get a whole new list of problems now. But this mold isn't, isn't ideal for me. And I know it's there. How can I make it so that I don't feel the effect of it? Because I knew that my mental masturbation would be like, hi, how about we get mold removal? How about you pay to get mold removal? And you get, and they come in and they gut everything. It's a process. It's, you need people who are trained in this because they go in there with machines to make sure, you know, you don't take out things that are important for the structure and for the plumbing because it was under the sink, but also they take all the mold out and then they put in new equipment. You know, they have contracting skills. They know how to install that. I don't know how to do that. Was I willing to learn that just because of the mold, just to get that dopamine hit? No, there's way easier ways to get that dopamine hit and to have that act of self-love than learning how to be a contractor. That's obsessive compulsive. And I sometimes order that line. For me, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. So I was like, well, I don't want to be homeless. I don't want to hire mold removal people. I don't want to learn how to remove mold. But I want to live in this environment harmoniously without affecting my health. So then my, my focus shifted on how do I make this perfect versus how do I make this enough so that I can feel safe in my home and not have to worry about my throat hurting me all the time, which I found. I looked at products online and I said, okay, if I buy this concrobian or so whatever it was called, concrobium, and I spray that, and then I clean it, and I don't use bleach. I just use disinfectant, and then I buy a face mask when I clean it, and I cover my eyes, and I wipe it all out, and then I cover it in, in, in this garbage bag and you know airtight as much as I can. That's the best I can do. And does that going to affect my health? Luckily, it made my health better, and I didn't notice it as much. But also, the stress of having that in there could have been worse for me than act the actual mold itself. So I had to come to terms in my own stomach in my own gut to be like, okay, I know it's there, but I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm friends with it. I did everything I could and I put in the self-love that I needed to put in and it's okay. It's not going to kill me. It's not going to cause me to be uncomfortable. It's not going to be something that I can use an excuse, as an excuse because I didn't work as much as I wanted to. Oh, it's the mold because I don't feel motivated. It's the mold, you know, like it's so easy to point fingers at that because it's there, right? So that's what I would say to people who have mental masturbation 
is create a relationship with it where you can do whatever you can, but also you don't have to go above and beyond every single time. You have self-love in other ways that you can create through your body, through your health. Focus on those things. And if there is something in there, if there's mold in your life, like a metaphor, do whatever you can about it in the moment. Maybe one day, yeah, you'll be successful enough where you can just hire mold removal people at any point that just comes and takes care of your problem. But I'm sure you'll have other problems that you don't have mold removal people for and don't have abilities to figure out. So instead of being able to fix all your problems, a way better practice is to be able to learn how to mitigate your problems and not only in the physical realm, physical world, but mentally mitigate your problems. You know, you mentioned how you get these dopamine hits. Mm Mm-hmm. I get cortisol hits. Mm. Yeah, and absolutely. So it's very different for me. It's maybe the opposite for me. And it's because, and, and, and now we want to get a bit into childhood trauma mm. <laughs> because it's one of my favorite topics. Um, for me, it's, there's a routine in my life, right? I, I wake up in the morning, 5, 5.30, 5.45, something like that. There's no alarm, but 5.30 is the average and then 5.30 to 6.40, I do FOD work, right? I respond to Slack messages. I read, um, you know, I, I take my FOD. I, I take a shit if I need to, brush my teeth, blah, blah, blah. And right at 6.40, my alarm rings to go to the gym, to go to jungle gym. And I go there and then I'm there till 9. I, I eat breakfast. I come home. Martha, Martha has breakfast ready. You know, if she comes with me, we come home and then she cooks it. And then, and then we go to digital jungle, we work till, you know, five ish. Then we come home, cook dinner. Right. And, and I, I'm, I'm reading all day. I'm, I'm writing stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm helping out people in the team to solve problems for our customers and help helping to spread the brand and, uh, and preparing for the podcast, so on and so forth. So my life has a routine and I love that routine. I love that balanced bliss. You know, I'm in the moment, the nasal breathing, the breath work in the morning, the three, three, one minute each (laughs) cold, cold baths. I've been doing that since we got here. Right. Which we made up. Which we made up. Who knows? Who knows if that's the best way to do an ice bath? Doesn't matter. But it feels good. It doesn't matter. It feels good. It feels cool. We enjoy that. We get the shivers. We enjoy the ability to go in and out. I love it because I can go between different Qigong poses between them, like sets. It's easy. The zen, the zen it just swings. feels good. I love that. It just feels good. <laughs> yeah, man. So, and you're actually the one who who f- was the first person to show me or even mention that if we shiver and then go back, right? You, you, you do the one minute, you come out, you do the zen swings, and now you're feeling sort of a contrast. And then you go back. And then you go back again, right? And And like you said, this is not the best. Like, for example listening to James Nestor, right? Wim Hof is not the best. There's holotropic, there's Kriya that he talked about, which our our boy Ra of Earth, you know, taught you. And and I remember watching- Yeah, the Kriya of the Weeks every day. Right, and I I used to watch that, like, like, I don't know, 2018, uh, when I was, uh, when I first heard of Ra of Earth from the Butthole Sunning video, (laughs) right? I was like, oh, who's this cool looking dude? Oh, it's Ra of Earth. And then I started following him on Instagram, so for me, I believe that the cortisol spike is a childhood trauma of something that takes me away from doing my homework. Something that takes me away from studying. So for example, I would be studying my, my and, and my parents are just like yours, you know, academics are everything, uh, you know, athletics don't matter, music doesn't matter extracurricular activities are going to hurt your grades. So don't do any of that. That's more, my parents were a little bit more balanced than that, okay. but I can imagine yours, especially not at all, upbringing. man. Like I, I, in my uh, freshman year of high school, I made it as a wide receiver for the football team. Wow. Wide receiver. I was good, bro. Like these big hands. Right. <laughs> and it's like, Mix. I could catch and I knew how to, and I had like no training in football. Right. But I was playing with my friends and I could like catch anything, bro, like anything. I was like killing the, the actual football players. And that first like couple of weeks in to my to, to training in the in the foot in the in the football team, I got my first B. Oh, 
And this was like on a homework assignment or a quiz. It wasn't like a B report card. That would have been murder, right? I would have been killed. Uh, it would have been a jihad fatwa, right? Um, and, and so that didn't happen. But I got a B on like some homework. And my parents freaked out. I also a little freaked out, a little bit. It's scary. Because my getting good grades was the biggest dopamine hit of them all, mm -hmm. right? So now it's like, oh, I, I want to play football, but not more than making my parents proud, mm -hmm. right? Disappointing my parents is the, is the foremost pain point. So I was like, okay, I'll quit. Cool. I quit. I was in band. I was playing violin. Quit that too. Quit. Wow. And so that trauma, whatever that is, right? That, hey, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, which is get good grades. And fair enough, man. Of course, my, my parents want me to be successful. And for them, getting good grades is the key. And so if you fast forward to today, right? Me thinking about Ethernet. Or me thinking about EMF, you know, the science of EMF. I even already pulled up a TED talk that I'm going to watch later today on EMF. Um, or, or even um, the mold, right? The allergies, the, all the stuff that we're doing for Martha with the, with the allergies and Dr. Venkat's recommendations. And I got the Chiwan Chiwan Prakash, Ch uh, Prash, mm -hmm. gel, uh, the, the, the jam. on the back, yeah. Yeah, the 35 herbs. I got that. Um, and, and I got the, 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 the gelatin powder grass fed that you recommended. I got awesome. that from Amazon, right? A lot of those great things, but for me, it's a cortisol hit because for me, it's like, fuck, I'm going to figure out how to get a, I don't know, a 20 meter ethernet cable. That's going to go all the way from the modem to here, make it all neat. I'm going to bring the cable management guy in again. You know, I, I was thinking about all this as I was riding the bike, bro. Mm -hmm. Like, no, no, no joke. And it's like, I'm going to bring the Ethernet cable here. I'm going to plug it in. I visualize this whole thing as I'm riding my bike. And then, and then it's like, yeah, I'm going to get one over there in case Martha wants to use it. Right. So I'm like going through all of these possibilities in my mind, but it is not dopamine. Man, I just wished there was no problem to be, begin with. Right, right, right. Like there was no Wi-Fi issue to begin with. So it's, it's a little bit different for me. And this takes me back. I mean, there's no answer to this. This is life. But this takes me back to what happened when the photographer asked us for a video at Jungle Gym. So we reacted so differently. Right. That's why we reacted so differently. We were the opposites of that. It takes me back to that trauma, right? For whatever the trauma that is. So tell me, tell, tell, tell me about the scenario, you know, because... Um, not everyone knows what happened, right. right? And only the people who would watch Jungle Gym would see the, the videos they took of us, right? Right. But what actually happened that day? Take us through it because it's very important. It was a big lesson because we, us three talked about it right. after. Right. And we got an insanely new perspective. And I really learned a shit ton that day about my childhood trauma. And I was watching Tim Ferriss's podcast with Dr. Paul Conti. Yep. Then I saw his, uh, his, he just recorded with Lex Friedman. So I'm going to watch that too. Right. And I got those three books about tra trauma with, you know, Dr. G Gabor Mate, Dr. Gabor Mate. So take me through that day. What happened that day? And is that for you a traumatic, some traumatic experience from childhood? And are you working on things like that are you letting those emotions come up and are you fully feeling those emotions because i have completely regard disregarded all those emotions in my life why mm -hmm. because i have to study man I, I gotta get good grades i don't have time to weep around about my childhood yeah take me through it childhood traumas man so jungle gym we showed up that day. It was another normal day. We ended up going to the gym early, and it was more crowded than usual. There was a photographer there. I didn't think too much about it, but it seemed like they were doing photos. I didn't know if they were doing it of certain people or if they were asking people to take photos, but it was just normal. I did my breath work, which is a great exercise for me. Like you, you talk about this. You don't care about it. You do it. Whenever I do breath work, 
there's always a part of me that uses it as not only breath work, but as a conditioning exercise for my brain because it's dis- it's uncomfortable. It makes me feel like, man, I wish I can be in here and like fit in, but this makes me stand out. So therefore I should do it more because it makes me look weird. It makes me look ostracized, which I have to be okay with and I'm learning to get better at. So I was doing my breath work and it was even scarier that day because there was a photographer there. And I was like, okay, I could try and go, you know, get involved or I could do my normal routine, which is what I wanted to do, which is what I did. And it wasn't until much later on in my routine after the ice bath, after being my morning stretches and my breath work, of course, that I was on the rings and they came up to me and they said, hey, can we get you on the rings? And I knew that they wanted to get me because I was on the rings. They wanted to get photos of the rings. They didn't have ring photos yet. My first thought was, oh man, I I want my community to be involved in this. Like I want to do this with, I want to have like my people with me, you know? So you and Marta were there and I wanted everybody there. That's such an interesting thing because that's a collectivist attitude. Most Americans, which you are one, Mm -hmm. don't have a collectivist attitude. It's a very individualistic personality. And Sapolsky talks about this in in the current chapter nine of, of the Behave book. He's saying that if you look at American culture, it's very individualistic. I, me, right? That These are the pronouns we use. Whereas East Asia is all about we, mm-hmm. us, right? But you thought collectivist. Yes. Whereas I didn't. Yes. So go on. So I thought collectivist, but for multiple reasons. For you, it was, it was compassion and love. But it was also because I was afraid to go alone. Fear. It was, I don't want to mess up. I do better with groups of people. I like being in a group setting because I like being in the limelight. I like having the attention on me, but I also like doing with people around me. And I like being part of something even bigger because I'm not the focal point. I like having a big group or at least a couple other people that I love and care about that I trust and respect, especially because you want to associate yourself with good people because it makes you look better. So I've always wanted to be associated with good people. Not to... Not to welcome them to your, to, to, to the love and the, the community, but so you can look better? It was because I didn't want to, if I made a mistake, it wouldn't be focused on me. Uh. It wasn't because I was trying to compare myself to them. Mm. It, was, it was taking weight off my shoulder of, okay, if something goes wrong with me, I have my community around me. And we'll all support each other and hold each other up and have our own strengths. And that's what the focal point will be. So if I don't know what to do or say, or I don't, if I miss something, then my friend can do something they're good at, and it balances out. So for me, especially in that, there was a sense of ego of like, okay, I can do a muscle up. I'm on the rings. I went, They want photos of rings, right? So I kind of asked like, hey, do you want me to like hang on the rings? Or do you want me to up on the top of the rings? And I said it in like a way of like, oh yeah, yeah, this would be cool. Which they don't even know what that means. They have no idea. They it's just, just like, oh yeah, just do whatever. Like just, yeah, just go for it. So I was like, okay, cool. I'm gonna do a muscle up. I'm gonna be up there on the top of the rings. You have the, you know, the external rotation. It looks cool like a gymnast, like an Olympian, right? And there was a part of me that was like, man, this is scary because I don't have my people around me. It's just me. You didn't think of doing the round, round thing that you did? I did eventually as a part of like, okay, I'll do the round, round thing because, because it looks cool. You're really it looks good. cool. And I'll just do that so they can take a photo of that because it looks difficult, but I know I can do it. 100% confident that I can do it. Muscle up, didn't know, didn't practice it. Haven't done it in a few years. Haven't done it since 2020. No, 2021. And I was like, Am I going to be able to do this? This is terrifying. Where am I? Where, I need my support. I want my people around me because I want them to do it. I want to be able to have my spot, my, my time to shine, but I want my people to shine as well. And while I'm figuring out my moment and getting to the muscle up and getting comfortable, wow. I didn't want the attention on me. I wanted my friends to have the, the focus and I wanted them to be the center of attention because I want them to shine. I want to work together. And I thought, how cool would that be if... Everyone else could thrive together. But for me, it was the sense of, oh man, I have to do this. And back of my head was this feeling of, this is, you know, no big deal. But I hope I was thinking, man, I hope my friends get asked to do this. I really want them to get asked to do this because I got asked and I didn't want to be the only one who got asked. I wanted everyone to be there. I wanted everyone to be asked. Even if we weren't together in the same shot or the same scenario, I want everyone to be asked. So when you were asked after me, and of course I was like, okay, this is embarrassing. I can't do a muscle up. And they're like, oh, it's fine. It's fine. I felt like a guy who couldn't get his dick up. Honestly, that's where I went. I went to a place of shame of like, I know mentally 
everything that I need to do, but it's physical. I have no control over this. It either happens or it doesn't. It's binary. And I wasn't doing it. And I was like, I need to get this done. Like I, I was so frustrated because I couldn't get this done. So in my head, it was like, okay, I'm going to take a break and then I'm, I'm going to do it without anyone looking. I'm going to go back and be like, okay, I'm ready. So that's what I was waiting for. That's what I did. But in that time, there was also a, a person that asked you to take some photos and you were like, you were like, no, 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 I'm not going to do this, this, this big bar because I don't know how to do that. I can't do that. There was no ego in it. It was just, it was no like, oh man, I know how to use the bar and they're going to see me do this. And I don't know if I can do it right now, but I'm going to try anyway. And maybe I'll fail. Maybe I won't. In your head, it was like, no, I don't do this. This isn't me. This isn't aligned with who I am. That's how I interpreted it at least. But you were like, but I do stretch. I do take care of my body in other ways. And you can take photos of that. It's like the, the story when we walked in and how someone was sitting in that chair and I asked to sit and they'd be like, no, 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 no. This is what I do. And if you want this, take it. If you don't leave it. So that for you was easy for me. It would be like, okay, I'll try. If they were like, hey, can you do that? Can you go up there and try that? Luckily, they, the other guy knew how to do it. But if they asked me to do that, I would have tried it. I would have been like, at least I'm going to try it. And I probably would have fallen. I would have embarrassed myself, but I would have laughed at it. And I would have been like, yeah, I told you guys. I would have preempted that with like, I've never done this before. So if I messed up, don't, you know, I'm not going at it with an ego of like, oh yeah, I'm the best at this. If I'm going to get it first try, it's going to be easy. You guys are going to get the best photo ever. I don't think of it like that. I, th- I give myself a buffer of like, I can't do this very well. I've never done this before, but you know, I'll try. It'll be fun. But with the rings, it was frustrating because I've done it before. But I didn't tell them like, I'm going to be a pro at this. But I also made it seem like it was no big deal because I've done it before and it has been no big deal at different points in my life. So the frustration came in like, shit, I can't do this. I worked so many years to get this muscle up and it was such an important thing for me at that time. And it's such a dopamine hit. Now I have cortisol. Now my cortisol spiked because I can't get this. I'm frustrated. I feel stressed out. Am I less healthy? Am I less fit than I was? Am I, is all that hard work not going to, you know, I lose that? So that's where that frustration came in of like, man, I wish I could just, you know, hit the gym and just take care of myself and get muscle ups whenever I get asked to, if this situation ever comes up, just like getting your dick up. I wish I could get my dick up because if this situation ever came up, I'd be frustrated because I wouldn't be able, I'd miss out an opportunity with a girl and this and that. And that's a big fear of why I don't masturbate or watch porn because I'm afraid of not getting my dick up. And if I masturbate or watch porn, that ta- that makes it less likely that I'm going to be able to get my dick up. So I use that fear to my advantage by masturbating less and by not watching porn. But coming back to the jungle gym, I wanted you guys to get asked. I got a dopamine hit when I saw you were getting filmed. I was excited that the people around me were getting filmed. And I thought of it as, okay, if they came to the gym and my friends got filmed and I didn't, it wouldn't be a frustration towards you. It'd be about myself. It'd be be a frustration towards um, of of my own abilities, you know, and maybe being like, oh man, maybe I should have asked them. Maybe I should have, you know, said something or put myself out there with them. And, but it would have been like, oh man, they got it. And I didn't damn, I'm, I'm jealous of them. It would have been, would have been me looking inward and being like, shoot, I, I messed up. Like I could have, you know, said something or I could have been around them more or tried harder. And then they would have been like, and then maybe they would have asked, but in the moment, they came to me first. So in the scenario, I was just at the rings and they wanted ring photos. And it was a sense of different feelings. It was, I wanted you guys to be a part of it. But I also was afraid of myself messing up. And I was scared of messing up. But I was also like, there's nothing else in this gym here that I would be able to do. And rings are kind of my thing. I can stand out in rings. I like rings and I look good in rings. And I know that it's aligned with with what I've tra- practiced in and what I've trained in. So it was like, this is fitting for me. This makes sense. If I was on like a machine or if I was doing bench press, I'd be like, I suck at bench press. My bench press isn't good. I do bench press for, for, for quality. I only focus on quality. They want someone with big weights. They don't want me for this. That would have been me telling me that I wasn't good enough. But with the rings, it's like, okay, I can show off on this. I can be a little show offy, which is fun for me. And then I couldn't do it. And I wasn't able to perform. It's like telling a girl about this great game you have. Like, oh, dude, I'm, I can, we'll have such a good time. We'll be so hot. And then you show up in the bedroom and then you're just like, oh, uh, yeah, I, I can't, I can't do this right now. You know, and she's like, what the hell? You said all these things and now you can't even perform? Like, what's going on? For me, the, the rings felt like that. But when I had you guys at the gym, 
with me, I felt a sense of companionship, safety. I felt good. I felt like I had you guys there and I wanted us to all come up together and rise together because I love when my friends get publicity. I love when my friends succeed when it involves the ability for me to not get screwed over because being screwed over in that situation would be shitty and would be super frustrating and it would make me feel terrible. So, so for example, say this is a totally situation of, you know, totally like whatever, like this is a situation that would, that isn't happening, but I'll make it up. Say you were on the rings, right? And say, I taught you the rings and we were working together in the rings and you were going to go backwards and you did some crazy trick on the rings that I taught you. Right. And they get you to do the video of that. And then the video blows up, you go viral and I was there part of the process, but I get no credibility. I get no virality, nothing from that. No financial success, no success. And my friend who I helped through this whole process, this doesn't associate me with that at all. Totally disassociates me with that. Pretends like I did nothing and takes everything for themselves. That's a situation that I'd get jealous in. That's the situation that I wouldn't want to happen. But that's the only negative situation I could think of in that scenario. That's the only time where I would have been like, damn it, my friend, I would be like upset or jealous because I've had trauma and that happened before where I've done a lot of effort and put work into something and then it comes to fruition and I get disregarded. So that is something that I feel trauma in, that I feel triggers me. But I never thought of that in the moment. I didn't think of that until we just talked about this and I just thought of that scenario. What would have gotten me upset? What would have triggered me in that situation? And that, it's, that, that extreme would have been the only thing. But everything else was like, oh, hell yeah. I would, the ideal scenario for that would be for all three of us to be in the video or a photo together, the video to go viral, the photo to go viral, and all of us to get this huge boost in uh, trust, authority from that, from that viral video slash photo. That would be my ideal scenario. If it was just me, I would actually feel a little bit guilty. Like I wouldn't feel as good about it. And I would like, I would want to leverage that ability to bring the people around me up with that sense of credibility because you guys were there. You guys brought me to jungle gym. You guys brought me to Tulum. That's the reason that all happened. It's like raw with the perennium setting. My friends who I perennium sunned with, they were all part of it. The people that got me to perennium sun in the first place, I thank them for getting me to perennium sun. And the reason why I went viral was because they told me to do it. So like, I loved the attention. I loved the virality, but every time I would be like, these people told me, like, I'm so grateful for these people because they told me to sun my perennium and it happened and it made me go viral, which was the coolest feeling. It was very egotistic, but it was so cool. It was such a big dopamine hit, even though it didn't give me anything tangibly. It was just clout as the, the kids call it today. And my face wasn't even in it. It was just my ass. But I still was able to go viral and it felt so good. But for me, it was never about, yeah, the whole system that was involved was important to me. So the gym situation shined a lot of light on that. So now I want to see what your rendition of, of, of that process was and hear that from your side. Well, first, I want to be fully, full disclosure. There was a part of me that felt happy when you couldn't do the muscle up. Mm -hmm. I have that evil. And uh, there was a lot of evil that I had that day. The first one was um, the thought that I am better than you and Martha. I had this feeling that I'm better than them. It, it didn't stay. It came and went. Mm -hmm. But it, it was there. Yeah. right? And I'm very aware of everything that happens. So even an evil thought, I don't just disregard it. I'm like, okay, all right. All right, that's what my, my thought, because, you know, you listen to Sam Harris, he always says, we don't know where thoughts come from. Nobody knows. Where the hell are they coming from? Right? Are, are they actually coming from my brain? Maybe. But like, why? Why did this thought just come today? Or why did this dream happen today? Right? Where these are, dreams are also sort of like thoughts. Like, how are they happening? So my thought, when I, when I saw you doing the muscle up, Right? I, I imagine it right now as I'm talking to you. I can imagine it. I had a smile on my face, right? Because I wanted to feel the bliss of my buddy, my brother, doing a muscle up and the world watching. I had this bliss. 
when you couldn't do it, I had a small, very, very tiny bit, ha ha ha, mm-hmm. sucker, right? Like a Raskolnikov killing right. that lady in Crime and Punishment, like that, like resent, like, oh, he got asked, or why she, because in this book, Crime and Punishment, that the lady's like rich and she like gives money to people and then, and then Raskolnikov eventually kills her. And then, you know, he goes through this guilt, this crime. And how he gets punished in his mind throughout the whole book. Sorry for everyone who hasn't read it. <laughs> um, but definitely it's a great read. And so when I saw you, I had this thing like, he got asked, right? And I can't, I have never trained a muscle up. So I have this insecurity that I can't do a muscle up. And I'll tell you another thing. If I had the feeling of fun that day, pure fun, of sharing love with the world, being in the moment, being in nature, being in the heart, then when that girl asked me to do the weird thing with the bar, I would have done it. I would have done it for the first time in my life, mm-hmm. pretending like I know how to do it, <laughs> like a goofball. And, and, and like when a I, child playing. Like a child playing. And even when I would fall, if I fell, I would pretend like I'm supposed to. Ah, you... Hey, you got that? That's a good one, eh? It's a good fall. It's the best fall ever. So that fun, that play, right? Yak Pengsap, Dr. Yak Pengsap, who's is no longer alive. He wrote this book, Effective Neuroscience. And he basically is the father, the founding father of the, the concept of play in animals. Right? He would like tickle rats and, and then they would have a different type of response and then he would show that, wow, animals can also play, right? Animals can feel tickle and have fun. So this concept of play, which is the nemesis, the, the other side of tyranny, right? So if you ask uh, Jordan Peterson or, or you know, someone who has that mentality, tyrannical thoughts that we have, right? You have to be the best, right? You, you better get the Wi-Fi off today. You better do your cold plunges today, right? Not fun play, but tyranny. Because you must do it. You must get straight A's, right? You must be, you must pray every day and, 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 and go to the, the prayer hall every day. You must. Whereas, hey, it's fun to pray to God. It's fun to see what my potential could be, what God could be. It's fun, right? It's fun to feel the community during prayer, or it's fun to meditate. It's fun to be in the moment, right? It's fun to go and fail at this bar, you know. (laughs) And I did it. I failed. I tried it. Remember in front of you, I failed. I fell on my back. I remember. I was like, well, that was fun. Yeah, I remember. And, and, And the fact that I remember during COVID times, I was in Vancouver and there was this one guy, older guy, like in his 60s or 70s. He was a gymnast in the rings, bro. He was doing all sorts of crazy stuff, like going around and round. And and he one time he tried to like teach me. And I was like, no, 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 I'm good. I'm good. Because I like the routine, right? I don't want to do things out of ego. I don't want to do, I want to do things purely, right? Like when I go in the cold bath, no one's watching me. It's just me, right? Sometimes if Martha doesn't come, if you're not there, I'm just going on my own. I'm doing the same thing, right? I don't need anyone to watch me. I full, fully love that. I have full play in that. And it's hard. It's difficult. So when they came to me and they said, hey, uh, is it okay if we film you stretching? I got a huge ego hit on that. Mm. Of course it was dopamine, right? But it wasn't, like a serotonin being in the moment, you know, the feel good here and now hormonal spike. It was more a, oh, what will this do in the future? And how will this help me, you know, save me from the past? How will this compensate for the past, right? For all those times when I thought I was ugly or unfit or, you know, no one would like me because I'm brown and Pakistani and, 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 and oh, because I can't speak English like them. Or I, I am not as, as athletic as them, you know, similar to your thoughts from your childhood. So I, I was like, oh, 
finally, you know, now I've like gained this revenge, right? It was these future thoughts. And so I, right away, when they asked me, do you want to, can, can we film you stretching? I was like, finally. Like, <laughs> geez, what like took you so pride. long? Like pride. Like, it took you long enough. It took you so long, man. Don't you know I'm a star? Like, do you know who you're talking to? You, you think I'm going to do this for free? <laughs> so so, so I, I kind of redeemed myself. It was a redemption. Yes. And then, and then I had the thought, you know, I should bring Jameson and Martha into this. I should bring them in. How cool would it be if us three stretched together? And then the thought took over. No, they asked me. And it's so interesting because we do our, our stay in the moment meditation. You know, we read Stoic philosophy. We read the great Greek and Roman philosophers. We, we meditate, we do breath work. But when it comes down to it, when the universe gives you that test, you fail. I failed. I big time failed. Because the right thing to do, regardless of if it goes to fruition, the right thing to do is say, hey, you know what? Jameson and Martha will stretch with me. And we're all going to stretch our own way, and it'll make a great video. Because it'll be community. You guys will show the community of Jungle Gym. Because us three come to work out every single day and we do it together. And we follow the same coach. We follow the same breath work, the same cold plunge routines. We are a family. But I didn't say that. Because when it came down to it, when it really counted, I failed. And when I failed, you know, when I fail, I really think about stuff. And I really sit and think. And what I thought, and I t told Martha this too, I thought, you know, when we have kids in the future, I will involve my family into the success, no matter what. If someone wants to take a photo of me, I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to bring my kids and wife in. No? Okay, so no photo. <laughs> I'm good. Because that, the, the, my child or my wife or whoever, part of my family, my parents, feeling, ah, uh, I wish I was there with Farhan. I can't live with that anymore. I sure can't. So that failure taught me the lesson. Bring your friends and family and success and, and share the success with everyone. Because it's everyone's success. Right? It's, it's the fact that I had my ancestors somehow survive through some adapt adaptable process that the other ancestors didn't for whatever evolutionary reason some adaptation some some trait that we had that allowed us to survive until today thank god for them thank god for the country i was born in thank god for the career that i have thank god for the neuroscience phd to, to ta taught me so much to go deep into science and thinking. Thank God that I'm able to contemplate this type of stuff. Thank God to live in, in, in a, in a, a, a you know, uh, freedom, a democracy. And your stories, your stories from your PhD and then going over to Vegas, all these different experiences that you'd said yes to at one time. Thank, Thank God. God for doing that. Thank God. And, and that lesson, that trauma from that day, I went back into my childhood, you know, what, what had happened that made me, like, whatever clues I could get. And I had a sense of gratitude. I had a sense of, you know what? This is a huge lesson. And it's a blessing, right? Because most of our weaknesses and failures are blessings. Believe it or not, they're blessings. Yeah. So let's use this blessing to always stay in the moment, always stay present, Take your time to make decisions and do what you really want to do or not do. Bring play into the world. Bring fun into the world. Because where there is fun and play, there is no cortisol. 
There is no tyranny. So that's what I experienced. And I want to ask you about your experience with getting screwed over. Because you just mentioned it. So it's on your mind still. Mm. What has happened in your past? If you feel like sharing, if you want to share, you don't have to say names or right. you, things can remain confidential, but someone could learn a lot right. from this concept of being screwed over because I also have gotten screwed over many times in my life. Right. Many, 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 many times. And I can talk about those instances too, but please share with us maybe the the thing that comes to mind first. Right. How you got screwed over and what you learned from it. It is a really beautiful experience. And I have shifted to gratitude for it. It started out with effort. I put in so much effort and compassion and focus and of course ego into something that I wanted to do it with people I wanted to do it with. People I really enjoyed, people I really liked, I really respected, I really trusted. And I enjoyed that. But there was also scarcity, there was also fear. There was anger, there was resentment. And this feeling became overwhelming because something that takes a while and working with others and shifting ideas and shifting people, I personally never had any idea to change ideas around. That wasn't the kind of person I was. I don't like changing people's ideas. If something works, I like to create stories around it and make it entertaining and share versus trying to change ideas. My passion and excitement comes in the storytelling and it comes in the expression and the way to expand something to create something but when it comes to creating these ideas my ideas are always like forced i feel they're very forced out when it comes to like the basis for something but then when it comes to names and and creating a story behind something behind a brand behind a goal behind commonalities between people i feel very strong in that field so i didn't feel like i was a threat but I also wasn't enough value in this situation with these people. And it was something that was important to me. It was fun for me. The first and foremost part was it was fun. It was fulfillment. It was the only fulfillment I had in my life at that time. It was the only thing that actually made me feel good about what I was doing. Felt like I was working towards something in my future. I was putting in the effort in the present and it was delayed gratification and it felt good. It felt like I was able to take this and work on it now and stay up late at night and go to these events and do all these crazy different trips and be able to be a part of something that was a growth for the future. And when I did this, I expected to be able to be part of that future, right? I expected to be able to be in that future table and that discussion. And I didn't want to impose my ideas and change things. I didn't want to have a vote. I just wanted to be part of that success. Because I want to be part, I enjoyed being part of the hardships and the difficulties and the shifts and the changes, but I also felt like I, that would also come with the ability to success. And if I didn't succeed, then no one would succeed because the whole thing didn't succeed. But my biggest fear was being a part of the growth and development and excitement and delay gratification and then missing out on the success right and of course when i went through this i changed as a person and my beliefs changed about health and my beliefs about what i was sharing changed but i loved the process so the end product wasn't as what i was excited about was more of the process i was excited about but i started to disagree with this and this was something that built a resentment and for a long time, there was this resentment of wanting that to not be successful because I was no longer in an involvement. And I got pleasure from things going wrong and realizing things and, and finding things that aren't going to work out and, and being able to experience that. I got a lot of pleasure from that because I felt wrong. I felt like that was karmic. I felt like I was wronged and I wanted those people to pay for that wrongdoing. Just like an eye for an eye kind of situation. And that was pleasurable to me. Now, at the same time... Were they aware of what they did? Or were they completely... I don't apathetic? think it was a... 
I think that they expected it to be like that. Because I was always the third wheel, but I like being the third wheel. I like being in that. It's like, you know, the third wheel is like, you know, you're not fully in, but like you're kind of in. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the underdogness of it. I just enjoyed being part of it. But I expected to have some kind of continual respect and trust along with that. I wasn't trying to take over anything. I wasn't trying to have ownership of every, anything. I'm, I wasn't trying to change or vote for anything. I just wanted to be part of that success in a tangible and legal way, right? So when that didn't happen, it was a shift, right? Things changed in life and things shifted. And of course, I didn't agree with it as much because I started to learn about health and sciences and uh, literature. And I was like, okay, maybe this isn't what I want to promote. But there's also ways to promote that in a positive light. So there's, there's a whole mindset that I have about doing the right thing and shifting in a progressive step. So you don't need to make a perfect shift, but say you're drinking Coca-Cola and then someone in, in is like, hey, try this um, sweetened by stevia or sweetened by organic cane sugar soda. It's still soda, but it's a step in the right direction. So I shifted my mindset to, okay, maybe I don't find it to be perfect. I don't find the outcome to be perfect, but I still like, the idea of being able to have a shift in the right direction. So I liked that. But then also it came to the outcome and the, and the companionship of how the story was created. And a lot of the things that was being promoted, like for example, say someone doesn't like partying and then they work on a product that becomes a party beverage, right? Say they're a, they want to be able to work out harder and they invent Red Bull. But then Red Bull becomes a party drink. And you're like, I don't like partying. I actually despise partying. I'm against it because I think it hurts people. But... The product fits in the partying mold, and that's what it gets marketed towards. That's how I felt with this as well, that I was like, okay, the end product, the end market here is something that I feel like has potential and has the ability to help people, but I also feel like it's it's not the right path. It's pursuing something that I don't think is good for the masses. It's something that I think brings in this sense of very few succeed, and a lot of people have to, you know, they get worse off. It, it builds resentments. It uh, makes them lazy. It hurts them. And there's a small group of people who get to benefit. And we were benefiting those small group of people. But the big masses were the people that were being hurt. So we were a part of that system. And that was tough for me too. But at the same time, like I didn't have, I wasn't like, I'm going to change it because it worked. It made sense in the moment. And in my head, I was like, I think this could be a bright thing. This could this could be a positive thing. I'm not passionate about this thing. I don't get excited about this thing, but I do believe this can be a positive and this could help people in the long run. You know, I don't I don't think it's a bad product. I don't think it's something that's gonna hurt people. I don't love the end market, but I do know that there's a lot of positivity that can come from this. And I want to focus on that. So I was able to come to terms with that. So for a while it was me telling myself, convincing myself that, okay, product's bad. And then being like, well, you know what? It's a step in the right direction. Second, oh, the market. I don't, I don't like the market. I don't agree with the market. Well, there's a potential to impact a lot of people positively. So you can't think of it like that as much either. Just because you don't see that yet doesn't mean that that's the full process. So then it turned into me being like, well, both of those things I came to terms with. But now I'm in a position where it's like, okay, we used you. We got what we wanted. You know, you put yourself on the line. You did these things. We appreciate it. But now it's gone. And... I was like, man, so I'm not part of this anymore. So I'm not part of the success of this. I want to be there, even if I don't have like any of the... Um, so they just told you... No, it didn't, officially it didn't happen as official or anything. It was just, you know, kind of like, like ghosting, you know, like in a relationship. Uh, if someone's like not that into you, they'll just stop talking to you and they won't have a conversation about it. It was kind of expected, like you're talking and it's flirty and maybe there's some things that happen. But then you start becoming more and more separate and more and more distant and then things just taper off. And maybe you see this person and you see these people you were dating and they come up again. It's like, hey, how you been? They kind of act like nothing happened. Hey, how you been? How's your life going? Oh, my God. It's so good to see you. That kind of situation. And everything involved with this is still like right now is still caring, compassion. It was never resentment of the people. It was always love for the people. There was always that care for that for the people involved. But then there was the, the, the end product that was frustrating that I was like, I would love for people to be successful. I want them to thrive and I want them to do well. But I just do not like that it's something that I put so much sweat and put myself on the line for so many times in effort. And then you end up getting 
put in a position where, oh, that doesn't happen. Like when I was mentioning at the gym, when, you know, if, if I were to be part of that system and then all of a sudden that person goes and takes that, I don't want to be front and center. I don't want to be the face of it, but I at least want to be part of it. I want to be able to be part of that in a way that's positive. And getting lost in that middle point was the most frustrating part for me, which is why I was like, no, I don't want to be successful. Screw that. Like it was a v- anger and resentment. Like how can I, you know, how can I get into a position where this can actually not be successful? That would be awesome. You know, that would be the best feeling because now I'm not involved anymore. And I didn't want to be taking over anything. I just wanted to be involved in some way. And because I kind of got cut off in the middle point, it turned into this like, well, now it's just trying to figure out how to make sure that doesn't come to fruition. And I didn't, I don't have any ability to do that. I don't have the power to do that, but it's just a hope that that would happen. You know, just like, ah, that would feel so good though. Wouldn't it feel so good? And that was why when I was in this environment and was working on this because it was so fun. It was just so enjoyable and I loved the process. And I was able to go through so many growth periods to learn about, okay, this changed, but it's, I'm still okay with it. Okay, this changed, but I can make sense of that as well. And, and I'm happy with that as well. But then once it totally shifted and it was just like, yeah, you know, not involved, out, I was like, damn, I feel bamboozled. You know, like even if, even if it was just for what the effort I put in, which is, I think is fair. Just a thank you note would have been okay. <laughs> something like that. Some kind of thing to the table. But now I think of it totally differently. Now I want it to be successful. Now I want it to thrive because I want those people around me to be in a successful position. And but yes, a part of it is because I want to be able to involve myself in that success and be able to use that and help each other with that level of success as well with what I'm doing now. But there's also part of it of that's my, that's my tribe. That's my people. That's my, you know, you think of like your five closest people and you actually, like those are the people. And I would love to have that mm. environment where I can have people who are, who are mentors and who we can teach each other things and who are successful in their own rights and successful in their endeavors. And we can bond through that and that can strengthen our friendship. But then it comes at the price of, well, if they do that on their own, how do I get to that table? I still need to get to see to the table because they're valuable people now in, in, in society. How do I become valuable people in society so that they want me at that table? So that's the next question. Instead of shifting it from resentment of, okay, I don't want them to do that. I don't want them to be at the table because I can't be at the table. Instead of that spite of being like, screw them. I hope they never get that table. I was like, I want them to be at the table, but I want to be there with them. How do I get to that point? How do I become a seat at that table? And I have that close knit community so that they are like, Hey, not, we don't, we don't just, we're not just at the table. We want you at the table. And that is my current mindset about it of how do I shift that? So it's not resentment. It's not a deathbed. Like, Oh, I'm so frustrated. I'm so jealous of them. I wish that never happened. Or I wish I did this, or I wish I did that. Now it's more of, I'm so excited for that connection and that ability to have that, that mastermind. And like and be able to bring all these people together and share and share our networks together and help each other thrive through that sharing. But I know that with that, I need to bring value. I can't just be there and just be like, be like, all right, here I am, guys. Like I'm a normal guy with a normal job and I don't have anything to bring to the table. I need to have value in that circumstance. So that is where I shifted my focus to. And it's still something that's out, uh, outgoing and a goal and it's scary because it's on my shoulders now and all that work I put in teaches me things and there's lessons, but I don't get to, you know, it doesn't hoist me up at all. There's no value that I was able to take from that other than things that I've learned and lessons I made, maybe a couple of people that I've met. But other than that, I don't get to be part of the big picture. But now it's about being at that table and supporting them because they're not at that table. They're not at that table yet either, but I know they can be, and I know I can be as well. And my goal is to be at that table together. The only thing that I'm worried about now is them being at that table and me not being at the table. But the only thing I can blame myself on at that point is myself. Instead of resenting that, instead of resenting them for not, for not being inviting me to the table and taking me along throughout their journey is not going on my own journey and getting to that table and being able to be part of that networking community. That's beautiful, man. Yeah. As you were talking it was reminded of the Cain and Abel story mm-hmm. that Jordan Peterson always talks about, right? So from, my, from what I gather from your story is, 
if we relate it to Cain and Abel, it's that you presented God a gift, which was your third wheel contribution. Mm -hmm. And in this case, God didn't accept. No, mm -hmm. you're going to be ousted or you're going to be ghosted. Right. And rather than being Cain and continuing to pray or hope for their failure, which is what Cain did, he killed Abel. Right. So you were trying to kill Abel in your own way. Right. Right. Through hope and 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 perhaps a bad vibe sending. Mm -hmm. Rather than doing that, you stop yourself and say, no, I'm going to give a better gift to God. The best gift I can give. And Abel can have it too. Right. They can have the seat at the table as well. And so can you. That's really interesting, man. And, and it also got me to think, I don't know if you've read Good to Great. It's a really, really amazing book. It's about business and uh, what's important in building a business and things like that. Uh, one of the McKinsey uh, uh, partners wrote it. And he, was, he had like a lunch with a Harvard professor in business and they were talking and the Harvard guy mentioned something and he's like, oh shit, I can write a book about this. And then he spent like six years writing this book with a big research team and everything. So one of the parts of this book, and it also talks in, uh, I think it's chapter four or five, it's called the Hedgehog Principle. Okay, well, before we get into that, let me, let me talk about um, something that pertains to what you said, then we'll talk about Hedgehog. Something that you said is you want your community to thrive, even without you, even with you not there, you want them to thrive. This is an interesting thought because a lot of CEOs, when they are great leaders, the company continues to do well after they retire or die, or quit, whatever. The, co the company stays great. Why? Because it's not a one-man show. They didn't just build a company on their own pedestal and leave everyone to rot, right? They, it's not like, I'm not going to train anyone. Everyone is my minion. And when I, something happens to me, the company can go to shit because I'm not part of the company anymore. Who cares about the company? I care about myself, right? It's an individualistic sort of American point of view. Right? But obviously, a lot of Americans are collectivists too. But then you, you look at companies where the CEO did leave. I mean, just look at Google, right? Sergey Brin and Larry Page, they've left, right? It's, it's uh, the, uh, uh, Sandar Pichai. He's the new CEO. I think, I think that's his name. Or, um, I mean, this happens a lot, right? The CEO leaves. I mean, Steve Jobs left. And, and Tim Cook is doing good. So the, the fact that you train your community or your family to do amazing without you because you want them to thrive even if you don't get the credit. Right? Absolutely. That's the thing. So you, at, at a certain point, you wanted, and, and fair enough, man, justice, right? You want justice. You don't want to take part in something and people just take full advantage of you and screw you over. That's not justice. That's, that's I mean, it, it's like, you know, there's this uh, game. It's called, uh, well, there's a prisoner's dilemma, which is a game like that. And then there's another game where it's like, let's say there's a dollar, right? And uh, I don't remember the, the name of the, it's going to come to me. But let's say there's a dollar and the, the scientist comes up to you and says, hey, here's a dollar. You can give Farhan whatever you want out of this dollar and you can keep whatever you want. If Farhan accepts, you get it and, and Farhan gets it. But if he rejects, you both get nothing. Right? So some people, what they do is, you know, they're, they're selfish. So they're like, oh, I'm going to keep uh, 99 cents. I'm going to give him a one, one penny. Right? Now, what they found is, when, when this is a, it was a testosterone study. And what they found is, when you inject testosterone into a person and you significantly increase their testosterone, their ability to say no to getting screwed over increases. So whereas before, I would be okay, yeah, at least I get a penny. Big deal. Okay, I get a penny for free. Okay, he screwed me over, so what? Either I get a penny 
or I get nothing. Right? So I'll take the penny. But you lose status. Ah, it's a status play, right? You are being treated unfairly. So in this study, they inject testosterone and their testosterone significantly increases. And these people who used to say, yeah, it's okay to screw me over, say no. I reject. I would rather get zero than feel low stress, uh, low status. I would rather get screwed over than feel low status. And this is, this is unbelievable because any rational being, right? If you look at it rationally, which humans aren't, right? If you look at like all the economics people used to think that humans were rational. But then uh, Tversky and, Bill and, and Daniel Kahneman came in, right? They, the, the book Thinking Fast and Slow was written by Daniel Kahneman. They won the Nobel Prize, Amos Tr uh, Tversky. They did these studies where they showed that human beings are completely irrational, right? You would not take a penny. You would say reject because there is this feeling, this emotion that we are driven by. So the fact that you were able to say, look, I want to get treated correctly. Yeah, I, I wish them the best, but it is still not fair, right? So if, if they ever came in front of you, and, and, and you had nothing to lose, and it was like your, your, your last day on earth, you would probably say exactly what you want to say. And you wouldn't hold back. This is my opinion. I don't think you would be Mother Teresa woo-woo <laughs> at all. You would just, you know, fl flip them off and say, hey, you screwed me over. And this is it. So the, the reason I brought up testosterone here is because I want to ask you, and this is one of the questions I wrote before the interview, is that, um, your testosterone levels have always been, you know, very high. 1,300 nanograms per deciliter, also high free testosterone. Like, you know, I think your last, one of your results was like 180 picograms per milliliter free testosterone. It was very, very high. And um, so my question is, your testosterone levels, have they always been high since you've been checking it? And also, what... For, for someone who has low T and wants to improve their life, and not just for the number aspect, right? They want increased energy. They want increased muscle mass. They want to maybe sleep better. Maybe they want a bedroom performance to improve, right? Maybe they want their, their drive to come back, right? To have sort of like uplift themselves so they can play with their kids and grandkids. And how, what sort of, tips would you give maybe like your top three tips for getting someone's testosterone up to par and also explain why yours is like has been super high and and and, and uh I, i'm sure it's higher than those people who screwed you over <laughs> <laughs> well that goes to show too about the importance of it but also not everything People mentor masturbate over that so much. I need to hit this number. I need to do this. I need to become this, become that. It's about awareness and understanding what's optimal for your body. But when I started getting checked, when I first got my testosterone tested, and I was about 23 or 24 years old, I had 1031, 1031 nanograms per deciliter. I had a pretty normal free testosterone, right in the average range, and a very high sex hormone binding globulin. Now that, I would say is one of the first tips, probably the most important one, but also checking your levels isn't going to increase your levels, but it is going to give you a great starting point to look at what you actually need to do in order to improve it. Mm. For me, I knew it what was is SHBG? SHBG. Sex hormone binding globulin is something that binds to your free testosterone in your system. And unlike something like um, albumin, it's very hard to unbind from that. So if you have high SHBG, your body isn't going to be able to use that testosterone as it's needed, but it's still going to be a lot of total testosterone in your body. So SHBG is going to bind to that total testosterone to decrease your free testosterone, decrease your bioavailable testosterone, which is the testosterone that is free and binded to albumin, which is much easier to be broken from than it is from SHBG. So when you have this SHBG, it is more of an issue of trying to manage it by getting it to normal levels versus trying to just pump your testosterone up. 
to just try and out- offset the highest HPG. You want to get it into a manageable level versus getting your testosterone super high so that your free testosterone is high. It's much, much healthier to manage that SHBG in harmonious ways than to just be like, well, we need more uh, we need more water in here. Let's just pump more water in. And then the SHBG has more testosterone to bind to, but also it's not going to be able to bind to everything. So your free is going to naturally increase as well. However, optimizing it naturally, you want to make sure you do it in every way you can because getting higher testosterone isn't going to be as natural to you as being able to increase your free testosterone because the SHBG, that's so high, you can be in harmony and harmonious uh, symbioticism with your body if you decrease that and put it into a healthy level. So that is where I noticed there was a problem, was my SHBG was sky high from, which myself and Andre and people in the academy like, like Brock, who have been very, very, very vehement with fasting, have learned that that could be an issue. And I've learned my whole life, ever since I started my health journey, I wasn't eating enough because I didn't know what, how to eat. I wasn't eating like my Subway sandwiches and I wasn't carb heavy as I used to be. So my caloric intake decreased naturally. And I was already pretty high when it comes to my metabolism. I never had an issue with weight. I actually had an issue with gaining weight. So when I stopped eating these carb dense foods, my weight stayed around the same, but I wasn't getting as many calories in as I usually did. So that had an impact on my hormone levels. And part of that impact was my sex hormone binding globulin. This is is all my inference of what was happening in my system. My sex hormone binding globulin went sky high because it had to offset that lack of food consumption. My body was trying to defend itself because it was always acting in either a caloric plateau or a caloric deficit. There was no excess in calories that I was consuming. So my body had to offset that. And hormonally, what it did was increase my SHBG. That's my best take on what happened. Of course, there could be other factors in there. It could be Wi-Fi related. Who the heck knows? But at least that's what I thought it was. And by switching my fasting routine, I found that my SHPG decreased. By stopping all the fasting I was doing, because I was excited about fasting because of because of the um, longevity aspects and because of the gut healing aspects, the stem cells and all this amazing research on fasting what kind of fasting was it like i was was it just intermittent i was doing more than intermittent i was doing intermittent almost every day and i was doing long-term fasts up to seven days Uh, and i loved it because it was easy for me to not eat because it was easy for me to avoid that because i had a relationship with food where i wanted to eat as healthy as i could and that came at a price fasting was free if i didn't have to eat I was getting benefits of being healthy and not spending any money. So in my head, that was like overload of excitement because I got to not eat and I got to take care of my body. And I didn't have to worry about buying food. I didn't have to worry about grocery shopping. I just went and lived my life, saved money and got healthier. I was like, what's better? That sounds amazing. So I was stoked. I was very excited about that. I didn't realize how much of an impact that had on my life. Because I had a relationship with food where I do get satisfaction from food. I enjoy mastication. I enjoy chewing food. I enjoy tasting food. I love being able to feel satiated, having a good, healthy meal, feeling full. But I wasn't eating, you know, cakes and and sugary treats and strong carbohydrate food. I was just eating healthy food. And that was sustenance for me. That felt good. I enjoyed the way that tasted. I enjoyed the way that felt, especially at restaurants. I was spending a lot of money on food because I enjoyed that. But with healthy food nowadays, compared to 100 years ago, healthy food's a lot more expensive. So I was spending a lot of money on food. I was spending money on restaurants to make this healthy food and putting all my money into that. Fasting was an easy option to avoid that. But I was also not eating a lot because these healthy foods weren't as fulfilling and calorically dense as the fast foods and the caloric dense foods that we're used to. So I was in this caloric deficit, and in my environment, I was working out so much. Three, four, five days a week, I was working out, working out, working out. And that was something that I always took seriously. So that was another thing that helped increase my testosterone, but also may have impacted my SHBG negatively, because I was working out extreme. Every time I did a workout, I didn't give it 100%, but every workout I did was tough. I was sweating. My heart was this pounding. This was during the CrossFit? This was during the CrossFit. I did CrossFit for 10 years. 
And I loved it. It was exactly what I needed at the time. Before that, I was a runner, right? I was doing long distance runs. Did not help me with that as well because I was losing weight and my body was like, oh, I don't need this muscle because I'm just doing endurance. So my cardiovascular health was great, but my, my endurance um, didn't need the muscle. I only had endurance muscles. So I was tiny. I was scrawny. I was a small kid. I didn't have muscle. My calves were jacked, which I was grateful for, but I didn't have any muscle. I was skinny. I would swim. I did that. That helped me grow up a little bit of muscle, but it was also endurance. I would always feel like I was an endurance athlete. Ah, long distance, long distance, no strength. I was always a long distance guy. So that also may have led towards my SHBG. And this is just from learning about literature and scientific papers now showing SHBG having changes from endurance activities and how testosterone increases or decreases based on your uh, physical activity and the way you eat. But at the time, I had no idea. All I knew is that my first blood test came in, which by the way, I had to go do and pay for myself because my doctor said I was too young to get my testosterone tested. And I had a good doctor too. She's a smart doctor and she still was like, don't worry about that. That's no big deal. Like she was all about gut health and thyroid health and eating the right foods and all these things. But for hormones, she was like, nah, that's not a big deal for you. Cause I wasn't having like, I noticed that I was having issues sexually, but I thought it was because of my partners. I thought it was because I just wasn't turned on to them. I had no issues with porn. I had no issues with masturbating to girls that I knew from school that I was attracted to. I had no issues with that. But with my partner, I had issues with my partners because I wasn't into them like I wanted to be. So I was like, well, my hormones aren't the problem. It's a mental thing. It's got to be a mental thing. And I still think it was a mental thing. But maybe my high SPG is something new with that as well. Who knows? However, the three big takeaways that I got for my testosterone health, for my own journey, was eating enough food. Of course, before these three takeaways, getting tested, checking my levels, seeing if there's anything else that might have been off, maybe vitamin D, magnesium, any minerals that my body uses in order to create and secrete these hormones that it needs for that whole process, had to be there as well. Luckily for me, everything was in good shape, but I knew something could have been could have been better. And that was my SHBG. It was bare and bold print, H, big high, right next to my SHBG. And it wasn't just high, it was way off the range. So luckily I had the group coaching and I had guys like Brock and Andre who were going through the same thing and were like, what the heck do I do about this? So we experimented together. My big thing was eating enough food. Having a healthy relationship with food really helped my hormone levels. That was a crucial step for me to take in my journey. And then that kind of was the, was the basis for me. That was what I needed the most help in, was just making sure that I ate enough and making sure that I wasn't eating to um, feel satiation of my mouth, like feeling like it tastes good, but eating to be full and not feeling like I need a fast or feeling like I don't need to eat this food right now because I, you know, I have to wait for my meal at this time and I'm hungry right now. I'm so hungry, but I'm going to wait. So that is something that I think is important is a healthy relationship with food. Now, if you're trying to lose weight, that's a whole different story. I was not trying to lose weight. I didn't have any insulin sensitivities. I wasn't trying to lose weight. I just wanted to have healthy hormone levels. And I also wanted to gain weight. I wanted to put on muscle. So it worked in my favor, but that was the basis for me was getting a consistent source of food in. And I was still high quality. I love high quality food. I would eat my eggs. I'd eat my grass-fed beef. I would eat my organic veggies. I would uh, make sure I can get whatever I could to get my calories in. And that was important to me. So almost too important to me. Like it was like my main focus was like eating enough. I would do anything to eat enough. You know, I would steal to eat enough basically. So doing those things was so important to me that I like prioritized it in my life. But my life didn't align with that. My lifestyle was not aligned with that. I knew that in order to eat more, I had to pay more. In order to you know, pay more, I had to earn more. And my life was not aligned with that. So I was like, well, what can I do to stay healthy? How can I eat healthy and stay healthy? So when it comes to the basis for me, it was just eating enough and getting into a healthy relationship with food and making sure that I could eat that food and feel satiated and not have hunger pains and be hungry before bed and then all morning be craving food and then not and like putting myself in uncomfortable situations so that I wouldn't be able to eat. The second thing for me was looking at my sexual health, was looking at how much I masturbated, how I would release so much fluid from my body and just waste it and just let it splooge out. I was doing that so many times a day that it was almost unhealthy. 
like maybe like twice a day. Was there guilt? No, no guilt. It was just, this no is guilt. how it is. It's easy. Exactly. It's the, it's it was, the right thing to do. It, was, it wasn't guilt. It wasn't shame. It was entitlement. It was um, feeling of like, oh, I shouldn't be doing that. I should just be able to have any girl I want. Like, why, I, I, why do I need to do this? I should just have some girl that I want. I want that girl. I want that girl in that picture. Why don't I just have her? Why can't I have her? I want to explore these things with her. You know? It was more of, um, it wasn't sexual shame in my family. I didn't grow up with sexual shame. I didn't grow up with that feeling of needing to hide myself or that pleasure is bad. I grew up with uh, supportive parents who, you know, were very important to the importance of pleasure, but also the importance of partnerships and loving someone and doing, going through that and not being, you know, liberal with it and doing it with everyone, but being able to have a solid relationship. But they weren't also like, yeah, wait till marriage, this and that. They were just supportive about pleasure. And they were very... Um, Especially my dad was, you know, a very good resource to talk to these things about and to learn about. I told my parents I had this issue. I told them that I couldn't finish with girls that I was with. And I was like trying to figure it out. And they wanted me to get help. They wanted me to go talk to someone professionally to figure it out. So they were on my team. They were supportive. And I felt like I could tell them anything about that side of myself. Because there was no shame. There was no like, how dare you do this? There was, And they've, they've caught me before. They've seen me do things. And I've been embarrassed, of course. But it was never like... Like uh, this feeling of like, you're a bad person for doing this and you're not going to be good and this is bad for you, which I'm very grateful for. I'm grateful there was no sexual guilt in my life. My sexual experiences when I was younger were very harmonious and very um, in alignment with each other. And um, you'd be able to have partners that at least I cared about. You know, I cared about these people. I didn't get in myself into any abusive situations or emotionally abusive situations. I had care and I had love for these people. So it was healthy. My sexual history was very healthy. But I still had issues. So I'm like, where, where's the issue here? Why am I having these issues? A lot of it was my brain and the ability to watch porn so easily. And that was my maximum pleasure. I never got into any crazy porn, but it was so easy for me to just watch my porn and enjoy it. And then that was what got me hard. So then when I would be with a person, it wouldn't work. I just wouldn't be able to enjoy it as much. It wouldn't feel as good to me. Or sometimes I would feel sick. Sometimes my stomach wouldn't feel good. I wouldn't like the way I felt. So that was another interesting situation. And about this time was when I did the group coaching, when I saw my levels. And this was about the same time I started to be more mindful with masturbation and learn about porn and learn about how it could be damaging me. So about the same time I checked my testosterone levels, I also was starting to change my, my habits. I was challenging myself more. I was approaching women. Um, which I've never done before in my life. And it still terrified me. It still terrified me, terrifies me to this day, to be honest. But I did it and I've done it before. And I was able to approach di different people and, and share that and have that group of people that were able to support me. And I had good intentions. I wasn't doing it to just get something from someone. I wanted to get to know someone and maybe have a date. But just the approach of this stranger was a very powerful tool for me in order to feel like I made a positive shift in my hormone levels. But before I could even approach strangers, I had to look at women differently. And porn taught me to look at women as sexual objects. That isn't going to be good to approach women because you go visit them and see them with so much stress and anxiety because you have this expectation from them and you have this entitlement from them and this anger and resentment towards them if they don't do what you want them to do. And they don't give in to what your demands are. So I had to deal with that trauma. And I had to deal with that history sexually in order to get better at porn and to masturbate in a much more safe and harmonious manner. And that is the second step that got me to improve my testosterone. Now, I already had 1031 testosterone, even though I you know, had these unhealthy habits and I wasn't eating enough. I was doing all these things, but I was also doing a lot of things right, which I have to be grateful for. All the exercise, all the, the nutrition, the ability to take care of my body and and understand that even at that time that maybe there are things I should be avoiding, like added ingredients, chemicals, things that I shouldn't be doing with my body, things that I shouldn't be putting on my body, creams, lotions, plastics. Maybe that stuff wasn't good for me. Who knows? As some of the research paper points to that, but like I said earlier, we don't really know for 100%. I just felt like I was doing everything right. So in my brain, it was like, you are doing a lot of things right. So that's another, you know, check off the box there. The... Porn thing, though, really, 
let a last, lasting impression on me because one thing I did notice when I got tested again was that when I didn't masturbate before my test, I had like a 200 nanogram per deciliter increase. So I would retain for about two, three, four weeks before my test, and I would have a, I would have a little spike. I'd have a little spike in testosterone. And that was awesome because I was like, it was like exciting. I was like, wow, maybe this is like, you know, good for me. That was like a positive reinforcement of maybe I don't need to masturbate all the time because my body actually does better when I don't masturbate all the time. And I'm so used to that because that's like my, my basis. That's my average. But that's not what my body thrives in. So it taught me that in order to be healthier, I masturbated less. And that was just positive reinforcement for my blood tests. But unfortunately, that doesn't work like that for everybody. Some people might masturbate less and their blood tests are the same or they go down. Who knows? But that was what I needed to deal with at the moment. That was what I was dealing with personally in my life. That was my sexual issue that I had to figure out for myself. And then once I got that all dialed in, I was able to see that positive outcome. And then that made me even more confident in the importance of that. And it also changed my performance in the bedroom, which is another big perk as well. And I wasn't even checking my testosterone for that. I didn't have any issues with my testosterone levels where they would say, hey, your testosterone level is the reason why you have issues in the bedroom. No one would say that because of where they were. But I still had issues. So I realized that that was mental. And I realized that if that's mental, then what else can be mental? What else can cause issues for me that I don't know about that are messing me up, even though I should have these numbers that look good. Everything should look good for me, but I still am not getting the results I want in life. So the third thing that I really had to come to terms with was the power of my brain and my lifestyle on my hormone levels, which is the most frustrating because it's as a man, you want to do something. You want to be like, oh, if I eat this every day, if I take the supplement every day, if I do this every day, it's going to help me. And there are supplements that work like that. Don Cataly, Shilajit, minerals, things that are able to provide your body with everything it needs and, and or even stimulate that production naturally in your body. Those are huge because I was taking supplements. I was taking Aphrodite every single day. I was taking Shilajit sometimes as well. And I noticed that with my testosterone levels, they increased. They went up or down and my SHBG decreased a little bit. And that helped a ton. With Andre, when we spoke, his SHBG was a huge part, was, was part of the taking Afro-D. With me, I needed more. I took Afro-D and my, my SHBG went down about 20 points, which is still out of range. And it wasn't until I did everything else and I made that shift in my whole lifestyle that it actually went to the next levels. Because supplements are fun. Supplements are easy as a man. You can take them. But it wasn't until I was able to associate the supplement with a positive shift in my lifestyle. And for me, I already had the gym down. I already had that side of life down. But it was the other side. It was the exploration. It was the breath work. It was the, the stress. It was the how to mitigate that stress level. How to learn more about my porn addiction. Learn about my masturbation routine how to have healthier masturbation sessions less often. That is what I really needed. And for me, it was very powerful because I was able to take something that, of course, had biological benefits, but was a precursor for me to be like, hey, I'm taking this effort effort within myself to do something good for myself. I may as well follow that up with lifestyle changes that can also support that. And that's where the healthy food came in, the supplements came in. That's where those things allowed me to reinforce that because I was always already giving myself self-love and I used that as momentum to continue that self-love into lifestyle, which is harder because changing as a man, changing being masculine and being like, I'm going to add this to my routine and I'm going to, you know, take a cold shower, check it off the box, right? I'm going to cook this food, cook this big steak, check that off the box and you get momentum and you feel good about yourself. So not only are those foods helping you in a biological level, they're helping you in a mental level. So that was the extra boost I needed because I could have eaten the steaks. I've been in that position. I've eaten the steaks, taken the supplements, had the right food, did the fasting, did the cold showers, and I still wasn't getting the results I wanted. I had a little change. It was nice. Biologically, things were happening. I had momentum, but it wasn't enough to make a huge shift for what I needed because I already had enough testosterone. My body was already producing enough testosterone. There was something else missing for me. Some men, supplements and food is what they need. Supplements, food, sleep, stress, those kind of things could, you know, double, triple 
your testosterone levels. But with me, it was a question of, okay, I don't actually need to increase my testosterone. I'm in a good place, but I need to change things in my life. What's going to cause me to change those things? Changing my diet, adding a supplement, being able to do things in my life that actually made me excited about taking positive action and feeling like I was helping myself and, and loving myself and getting that, that momentum, taking those little steps. I never felt like, oh, if I don't do this, I'm going to be bad. I'm going to be in a bad place or I'm going to get hurt. It was an act of self-love. It wasn't, I was taking this to, oh, I, I don't have this boner. I don't have this. I want to take this and then get that result. That was never my intention with it. My intention with it was always, I want to do everything for myself that is going to be helpful and loving to myself. And I know that these things are going to do that. And then when I took those things, I had more love for myself. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go outside in nature and walk barefoot. Who cares if anyone looks at me funny? I'm going to go and do breath work in public. I'm going to go spend some time just being able to sit with my thoughts and realize that when I have a stressful moment, I can sit with that and shift that into a moment that is actually positive for me. And hardest one of all, when I have an urge to watch porn, I'm just going to find something else that I want to do instead. I'm just going to shift that attention over. I'm going to shift that. I'm going to approach that woman. I'm going to be able to love myself in ways that I'm afraid to because they feel easy. They feel comfortable to me. And then I was able to finally get momentum in that. And having a brotherhood around that helps too. Having guys around you that are supportive in that endeavor that you can talk to about these feelings and these urges you have and they're giving you love and compassion and they're sitting there with you and they're like, yes, I hear you. Absolutely. I appreciate you. Thank you for sharing that. I've been there too. I can feel that. I feel that deeply. That whole combination was what allowed me to get my testosterone from about 10, 1093 to, to or 10... 31 to 1293, which was my highest testosterone levels, where, my, where I was about 180, like you said, for free testosterone as well. But that also became something of a need to get higher testosterone and being higher and higher and higher. And it wasn't until very recently where I realized that it wasn't the testosterone level that I was looking for. It was the ability for my body to self-regulate and have harmony with my brain, my gut, my hormones, my whole physical body, and my mental body, and my spiritual body in order to be in a place where I felt good. Because I had higher testosterone, and I still felt crappy. And I was like, well, that doesn't make sense. I should feel good. This is what I need as a man. You need to have high testosterone, and you're successful, and you do all these things, and you have this motivation in life. I didn't have any of those things. I just had the numbers on the paper. I'm like, this is cool. I can show this to other guys. I'm like, whoa, that's awesome. But what does that mean for me? What does that do for me? I had, there were guys who had way less testosterone than me who were doing awesome stuff. And I was like, what the heck? I want to have, I want to do awesome stuff. I want to enjoy life. I want to do cool things. I felt entitled to it almost. But I had to disassociate that with testosterone. And that was really important for me because it wasn't about my testosterone levels that made me do that. It was about my harmony within my body and my body's hormone levels being at an optimal range that allowed me to take those next steps. The testosterone wasn't going to push me off the cliff. I had to make the decision myself. Testosterone was just there to just make it um, more clear of what you needed to do. But I wasn't going to do it for me. And that was the beauty of the whole journey. So those three steps allowed me to get there. But the last one was the hardest. The mental side of it. The shift, the motivation, the realization that motivation isn't just going to show up on your door one day. The realization that you had to do something about it. And you had to take the first step, even if you didn't feel like doing something. And then you start to feel more harmonious. You still start to feel better. You start to have that appreciation. And then you don't worry about the numbers. Now, for me, the numbers are just how I'm feeling. And when I look at the numbers, it's a great sign of where I'm at and looking at my levels, making sure I'm still in a good range and making sure I'm healthy. But if I check my numbers tomorrow, say I went to... Um, I did every, I, I created content and I became someone that was able to share and create these experiences that I wanted to. I had good sleep. I had a good diet. I was eating enough. I felt great. I got sunlight. I got nature. I got breath in. I go to get my labs done, 800 nanograms per deciliter. My SHBG is right in the middle of the range, free testosterone, probably on, maybe in the middle of the high end. 
I'd be way happier with that than I would be if I went to get my testosterone levels done and I realized I had a four, 1,400 nanograms per deciliter natural and my free testosterone was 250 and my SHPG was perfect, but I was miserable. That was the part that I realized. I was like, dang it. This isn't my answer. Like, this isn't going to like solve it for me. I have to do the work. And this is going to help me. This is going to help me show the light, but I only need so much of it. It's only going to be, it's only going to do so much. Like if I have enough, it's going to do the job. The more I have is just going to enhance that, but there's only a threshold. Like if I was super low T and miserable, that would be like, okay, well, I got to increase my testosterone because there's a reason why my testosterone is low and I need to fix that in order to get things done and be able to take care of myself and make sure my hormones are good. But that idea now that I need to keep constantly increase testosterone, testosterone is, is not there like it used to be. And it's still fun. I love being able to say that it's still great to, it still feels good, but like, I don't look at it like that. Like it's fun to be like, Oh yeah, that was my highest T was, I was 27 and I got 1393. When I got that, when I got that lab done, I cheated on my girlfriend. Like I was like, (laughs) I was not in a good place in my life at all. I was very, very upset in my life. And I was in a very tough place in my life. And I was uncomfortable. I was scared. I was in pain. I was studying myself. I didn't know what the heck to do with my career. I didn't know where I was going. I got fired a few months before. Like I was not in a good place. My hormones were good, but where was I? I was in a place of guilt, shame, depression. And I realized that, well, that's not what I want to be. I'm glad my hormones are like that. That's great. And then I got my hormones tested the next year and they were about um, 11 something, somewhere in the 1100s, but I felt way better as a person and I was eating healthier and I was taking care of myself and I had a good gym routine and I had good friends. I had a community. I had people I wanted to be. I was dancing. I didn't have fulfillment that I wanted. I wasn't motivated to make, to do what I wanted to do with, with content. I wasn't making videos every day like I want to do, like I dream about, but I was still finding places in my life that felt good. And for me, it was like, okay, I've, I've been all over the map here with testosterone. I've been, you know, high SHBG, high SP, SHBG regular SHBG, a little bit high SHBG. But no matter what, like I still had the same feelings. I still had the same issues, even though I was all around this range. It was just about how I acted and how I responded to these situations that changed my life for the better or for the worse. Moving here, moving to Los Angeles when I first came to Los Angeles making those decisions in my life, I'm sure the testosterone had a role with that, for sure. Had a very important role. If I was low T, I wouldn't be able to make those decisions confidently and put in the effort to take that leap. But just because I was high T doesn't mean that solved my problems either. So I had enough testosterone to make the decisions I needed to, but I didn't over-obsess over getting higher and higher and made that my excuse. I wasn't in a position where, oh man, I only have 700 T. Well, once I get 1,000, then I'll be motivated because I had over 1,000. I had 1400 T and I still are 1300 T and I still wasn't motivated. And I was like, well, this isn't the answer. Obviously I need to do something. I can't just sit around and just do the mental masturbation stuff. The fun stuff for me as a man, Oh, I'll check off that box. I'm check off that box. I have to go do the work in order to actually get the benefits of that and get the fulfillment and get the peace. First and foremost, the peace is way better than the fulfillment, way better than these external things. The self-peace was what I was missing. So that was the important part for me. And everyone has a different path to get there. That was just mine. Man, I learned so much from this. <laughs> As you were talking, I, I had this feeling that I've read the literature on how testosterone affects behavior and vice versa. And you have, obviously, like, you know, the literature and the science, but In addition to that, in your practical life, you've experienced what it, you know, took scientists decades to figure out. And that is small shifts in testosterone cannot be detected and translated into behavior. Small changes in testosterone in the blood, be it total or free, especially if they are within range, will not enabled to bo- the body to do something significant. The body is not, it's not sensitive to those small changes. But you also touched on something super important. And that is 
taking a guy from low T to range, that's huge. But if you're, if you're within range, even if you're you know, 800 or 1,000 or 1,300, it's not going to change your behavior. So a lot of men, they are sort of, they have this uh, you know, big dick competition where, right. oh, I have 1,000 nanograms per deciliter. You have 700, so like I'm better than you. It's not like that, right? It, it's, it's like a, an IQ, right? An IQ test. You, you ask Warren Buffett. And one time in one of his interviews, he said, you know what, if your IQ is, I don't know, I think he's like 120 or something. If your IQ is above 120 or 110 or something like that, like above average, that's all you need. You can become the, the super successful in life. Because sometimes what happens is if you have your IQ is too high, or if you're like a savant or a photographic memory, then you have like huge problems in life. You know, if you're, have an, if you're on the spectrum or mm -hmm. you have some Asperger syndrome or something like that so you recognizing that behavior is not necessarily dependent on small changes in testosterone because your behavior wasn't what you wanted it to be your cognitive ability your ability to do hard things and challenging things and and be in the moment and be and share love and happiness you didn't have that. You cheated on your girlfriend, right? You did the opposite. Mm -hmm. You did something that is, is, shows a sign of weakness, right. not right. high testosterone. Exactly. And then it also took me to this concept of, this is huge, something you said, it triggered me uh, in a good way, this concept of gene-environment interactions. So there is no gene for testosterone because it's a, it's a sex hormone, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not something you have a gene for, but... We do have genes for enzymes that produce testosterone, right? Those, because those are, because testosterone is not a protein, right? There are, there are proteins like SHBG and other enzymes. SHBG is a globulin, it's not an enzyme, but there are other enzymes that help you produce testosterone out of the precursors of testosterone. And those are encoded by genes. But your DNA is not something that knows exactly what you're going to do next. There are proteins that turn genes on and off. And those genes turn on and off depending on your environment. So you could be in a certain environment and a certain gene come, turns on. But then in another environment, that gene will not turn on. So if you wanted to have a certain a certain physical manifestation or a mental manifestation of something that is encoded by your genes you have the disposition the ability to do that it would only be triggered by environment the gene itself won't do shit so you exposing yourself to different environments be it the people you are around the books you read the cities you go to the cultures you take part in, the coaches you get coached by, that environment most likely allowed certain genes to turn on, which you have. So your propensity to having a strong mind was significantly amplified by the environment you went in. And when you look at testosterone specifically, the environment and the challenges you do, the interactions you take part in, increase testosterone way more than testosterone increasing those things. So if you look at something like sex, having high testosterone won't necessarily make you have more sex. But having more sex will have a very high impact on your testosterone. Especially if it is accompanied by oxytocin, mm -hmm. right? By touching and love and bonding. So th this, is, this was super interesting because this concept that I need a very high testosterone level is a, is a huge myth. And I want to ask you about myths also because there's so many myths out there that men believe that are so wrong. Right? Unless your testosterone increases by like 10x, 
through steroids and, and, and something way worse than TRT. And, and if you're taking like four or five different androgen boosters that are injections, if you can increase your testosterone by 10x, maybe that may increase your libido or your bedroom performance or your aggression. But that's supra physiological response, supra physiological numbers. So, yeah, man, I mean, you, you figured all this out not only through the literature, but even before you read anything, you figured this out through your entire life's process of getting your blood test done so often. And so that's huge, man. It's a lot of, lot of respect for you that you took control of your life in your 20s rather than you know someone like me, like in my mid to late 30s, right? And I want to touch on this because you mentioned the three things, you know, the SHBG, the porn, and the cognitive right? The, the, the mental toughness. I also want to talk to you about what are, tell me the top three myths mm. that men believe, like something that is really hurting them. They believe that like, um, like they believe their name, right? Something they truly believe, but it is so wrong. And you know, this is wrong from firsthand experience. And you would like to inform them to stop believing in this fallacy. Mm, that's a good one. Three myths. The first one that comes to mind, the first myth that I believe a lot of men associate with their value and with their ability to be successful in life is having the ability to sleep with as many women as possible. That's a very prominent <clears throat> myth in the today's Head society count. getting more girls sleeping with all these different girls trying to get in bed with all these different girls and trying different girls sleeping as many girls as possible that they can attractive girls that they're attracted to and having sex with different women multiple women all the time as much as they can and if they don't they're a failure and if they do they're successful but the problem here lies in the action of actually connecting with someone on that level you're, yes, getting a benefit from boosting your testosterone and you are having sex, which is healthier than watching porn and masturbating, but you are breaking this bond with this person every time you leave them. You are intimate with someone. You share that experience with someone and then they move on or you move on or both people move on and you're dealing with that stress and that feeling of not even shame, because most men aren't shameful about sleeping with a lot of girls. They are actually very proud of it. They're not guilty of it. But there's also stress that comes with pregnancy scares, that comes with, with the wrong woman, that comes with diseases, not being safe. What could happen? Even if you do everything right, something can still go wrong. Terrifying. That changes your whole life. Every time you sleep with someone, you have to think about that. And your body connects with that person intimately. You develop a bond with that person. You have to break that bond. That gets very spiritual. That's hard. Men don't want to look at those emotions. Men think it's all a transaction. It's just basically based on pleasure. But just because it feels good in the moment in your body doesn't mean that your body is harmonizing with that shift and that experience with another person. Because you're putting yourself in a position where you are opening up to them no matter how dominant, no matter how manly you feel, you are putting yourself in a position where you are connecting with that person on the most intimate physical level possible. And you have to deal with whatever that comes with, whatever that breaks between you two, whatever that bonds between you two, and then getting rid of that. You just you move on because you sleep with other people and you have that multiple times. And you are sleeping with all these different people to give yourself validation, maybe feel good about yourself, feel good about how, how good you are or how, how successful or good looking you are, whatever it is that you're trying to fulfill for yourself. But this bond that you're breaking with the person each time is a grieving process. Even if you don't notice it, your body is breaking up that process in a way because you have connected with that person's DNA. If you have connected with that person on a, very intimate level from not only physical but spiritual point 
And you have to connect with that. And your body has to deal with that some way. It's energy. And as we know from Newtonian physics, energy has to go somewhere. It comes down to quantum physics at that point. But there is an exchange happening every time that happens. And when you're with someone, you are putting a burden on yourself. If that's not what is good for you and harmonious for you, and there's an opposite effect of that being with the right woman, and maybe you have multiple wives, you know, who knows, but being in a situation where that's a connection point for you, and then that's a support, and you love that person, and you consistently show up for that person, they show up for you, and you build that oxytocin and that serotonin, and you bond, that's one of the most incredible things in life right there. That improves all different aspects of your life. But that is also not going to make or break you. Just because you have a woman in your life doesn't mean that's going to fix everything. Doesn't mean you're going to feel good. Doesn't mean you're going to be motivated all of a sudden. Just because you have a child doesn't mean you're all of a sudden you're going to take on all these new roles and take on this new persona and be this new person and get rid of all your past issues. You have to look at yourself in the face as yourself and you can change in any moment. Those things may cause you to change, but they usually don't. Usually you fall back on the same habits. Sometimes they change the way you live. They definitely change your stress levels. They change the way that you manage your time and your money. But looking at yourself first is very important. So myth number one, sleeping as much girls as possible is what makes a man masculine. Couldn't be further from the truth. What makes a man masculine is his devotion to himself, his devotion to his partner or partners, if that's what he does. But um, it's really about creating that bond and understanding that that bond is going to be with you and if you break that bond and if you go socially connect yourself with a woman you're not only stressing yourself out from dates from pregnancy scares from possible diseases you're also stressing your system and your spirit out from connecting with someone on such an intimate level and then maybe not seeing them again maybe see them on instagram sometimes maybe just watching them you know for every couple of years that show up in your town and whatever but that is something that men put so much value in they think is going to fix all their problems. Most men I know live their life to try and have sex more. And that's their goal is to how can I live to, in order to optimize my pleasure and my sex life? So I guess that turns into MILF. MILF. MILF 2. Myth 2. Did you have myth 1? Yeah. But I never went through it like that. My myth 1 was through porn. It was never through interactions physically. Maybe like a little taste of that, but nothing crazy. No hoe phase, nothing like that. But I definitely went through phases where I've seen hundreds of women in the same day on a t on an internet on a screen, and that's the same thing for your brain. Your brain doesn't know the difference. No, I mean you're not creating that physical connection spiritually with that person, so it's easier to not be as stressful. And there's no pregnancy scare. There's no stress of you know diseases. But you're still creating that bond with your brain that makes that okay. That makes you feel like you're getting all these women, which also adds a sense of. I don't need to try because I'm already getting all these girls. They're just on the screen. I'm already getting all these girls. I don't need to try. So, so you genuinely believed mm -hmm. that you were getting these girls. I knew deep down that I was uh, like, wow, what a loser. There, there was a denial. Yeah, I knew there deep was down, a layer but was, of... But my body was getting the chemicals. My body was getting the intimacy chemicals, the horny chemicals of what I wanted. It was there. I didn't have to go for it. I didn't have to search for it. It didn't take any work. It was easy. Mm. Like an injection. And when you're addicted, every part of your body will make you think it's okay. Right. Because anything else is m much more painful. Yeah. Quitting the addiction is much more painful. Yeah. You know, this myth number one, I went so far as to develop a structural, like an organized plan where once I become a billionaire, what I will do is I will hire a team of doctors, and pimps and uh you know vip hosts at clubs you know like a team with medical professionals nurses and all and i would have parties at my mansion and the girls who want to sleep with me they would undergo an std in a separate room i literally devised this plan mm -hmm. and they would go through a live std test and they would get like a badge or some kind of like some way of knowing that this girl is clean and then I would sleep with her and then she would be ready to, you know, she would be free to go where she wants. And if she were to have sex with someone else, then she would have to sort of report to this database. 
almost like surveillance on all these girls. Mm -hmm. So, so my, my plan was basically to, you know, sleep with all these women have no, no, give, not give a fuck about any bonds or any of this relationship connection, but keep an eye to make sure I don't get the STD. And, and, and even when you think of like the IUD or the morning after pill or, or any pills that, you know, the girls take the birth control pills, um, my plan was to have a, a, an IUD doctor present and he would IUD her before sex with me. And then, then she, she can do whatever the hell she wants, take it out free of charge. I had this entire plan organized for my future. I see. Uh, One flaw in your plan. From a technical standpoint. Please. Of course. There's a lot of things that are funny, but the one flaw, every girl I know who's got an IUD has been sore for days after. So they wouldn't be able to go and get them. They'd have to come early and revise a new plan. That's a good one. Which is tough. It's a 12 hour. Girls have to go through that. It's It's very difficult for them. It's a 24 hour. It's very difficult for them. It's not, I couldn't imagine. Yeah. But I would have the best doctors in the world. I'm sure we could figure it out. Yeah, I know. (laughs) And it's also very simply to give them pills to get rid of the soreness, Mm -hmm. right? Maybe some uh, Joe Rogan style stem cell injections. Wow, you really went in. You know, so I would... So my thought was, you know what? Guys think with, like this. With enough money. Uh, yeah, this sounds, this sounds normal to me. I'm good. With enough money. It's like money, me with my shadow. Yeah. You know? Chloroform. Chloroform. Easy peasy. I didn't even want to have sex. I just wanted to touch a couple butts. Wasn't big of a deal. I didn't want to do the work, though. I didn't want to have to talk to the girl. Get rejected. You know? Hmm. Yeah. But on to myth number two. Myth number two. Yeah. Myth number two comes into pleasure and pain. Men think that Pain is masculine, but they live for pleasure, right? A lot of men are assuming that, that in order to do something, in order to enjoy something, has to come from pain. And at the opposite end of the spectrum, many men live with pleasure as their goal. They do things for pleasure. They party for pleasure. They go on adventures for pleasure. They explore for pleasure. They meet girls for pleasure. They drink for pleasure. They smoke for pleasure. They do drugs for pleasure. But they also have such a tough relationship with putting themselves in uncomfortable situations because a lot of men are told that they need to go through pain in order to get success in life. So they're doing things in life. They're going through college, hating what they're doing, hating everything about what they're studying, hating everything about the people they're around, but they chalk it up as, oh, this is just pain. I need to have pain as a man. Pain is is what men need. Now, that's not to be mixed with pleasure. Men don't need to spend their college years in constant pleasure because pain is very important and very beneficial. But it comes with the intention and the ability to put in pain as effort and put in pain as being able to understand that you could sit around all day and scroll on Instagram and watch Netflix. That's pleasurable, but you're going to have to pay that one day. That's a bill you're going to have to pay one day. And you can either do that now or put it off till later. So instant gratification and delayed gratification is the real trick. Mm. Pain isn't the problem. Mm. Sometimes pain is there. It depends on what's doing, what what the pain is there for. Sometimes pain is silly, like hurting yourself for no reason because you're trying to impress other people. That's silly. But sometimes you have delayed gratification. Sometimes you're in college and you're miserable and you're studying something that's really hard for you. But... You know that you could be partying right now and getting pleasure and you know, goofing off and not studying because what's, what's it going to matter, right? But the decision to choose that discomfort in the moment versus the pleasureful moment, it could also be just like, I'm going to turn on TV and watch Netflix right now. And there are times where that's important for men. There are times where they need to relax and need to be able to recover and to get better and heal. But there's also times where they need to put in effort and they need to try try something hard. Maybe it's sprints. Maybe it's a physical effort. Maybe it's an actual effort in their brain. Maybe it's a a certain thing they don't want to do. There's something that is there and they need to know if it's because they hate it and because they shouldn't be doing it and it's not for them or because they have pleasurable options that seem better in the moment. But they're going to have to put themselves ahead at one point or another and either they don't do the fun things now and get to do fun things later or they have to do all of the 
fun things now and they get through all the fun things now, but then one day they're miserable because they did all the fun things through their, their whole life and they put in all this, this pleasure, 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 mitigated all the, um, the delay gratification to get instant gratification. And then it comes back as like a bill, like, oh yeah, <laughs> you, you still need to do this. You still need to like take care of your life and take care of your health. And there's still things that you need to put the effort in and do the research on and experience and learn and grow in, but you didn't put them in yet. So having a healthy relationship with pain and pleasure is um, important. And the myth there would be that everything um, is about pleasure and pain is always bad. Because pain is very important. But you need to understand where it's coming from. It's not as simple as saying, this is painful, so it's bad for me. You just have to know if this is painful because I hate it, or this is painful because it's not for me, or is this painful because I want to go have pleasure right now, and I rather do the pleasure, but I actually want to, I actually want to learn how to, you know, build cars. I want to learn how to be a better mechanic. I want to learn these things. It's interesting to me. I want to have a faster car. I want to fix my car. I want to be able to learn how to take care of my fishing, like my, my, my fishing pole. Like who knows what men are interested in? There's so many different things. But they can also just go sit in, at the dock and drink beers with their friends. Or they can just go sit at the shop and drink beers and sit around and, and not have to learn those skills. So skill sets that you're interested in that involve work and pain in the moment are actually a lot better for you than going and doing nothing and sitting around and drinking beers and smoking something you shouldn't be smoking in order to get that instant gratification. Or at another end of it, if you don't want to study, you know, you're in school for political science, but you've always wanted to be a writer, that's a good sign that you're not doing the right thing. And listen to that. Mm. You know, the instant gratification brings me back to the Stanford marshmallow experiment. You know about that Yes, one, yes. Right? They tracked those kids. So basically what happened is you, all these kids uh, got a marshmallow. Right, so a kid gets a marshmallow, and the the guy's like, "I'll be back." And if you haven't eaten the marshmallow, you'll get a second one. Simple experiment, and they watch these kids through a mirror, through a you know the glass window, like you watch prisoners, and uh, they were watching what these kids were doing. How are they behaving with the marshmallow? And a lot of the kids ate the marshmallow right away. Some of the kids didn't eat the marshmallow for 15 minutes and they would like smell it, pet it like a dog, right? They would uh, like tap it on the, on the ground, listen to it, right? They, they would like, but, but not eat it. And they tracked these girls and boys, these children for 40 years, longitudinal experiment. And they found out that after these 40 years, the ones that had delayed gratification, had higher IQs, higher SAT scores. I don't, I don't even know. It wasn't higher IQ. That's, that's like more, more in, ingrown or innate. But they had higher SAT scores, uh, more success in their careers, like happier, all sorts of significant differences than the ones that ate the marshmallow right away. So it makes us think that even as children, we may have the propensity to have delayed gratification, right? So for example, when I was studying in, in elementary school, I was, you know, like I remember back home in Pakistan, what would happen is once the semester is over, we all get ranks. Someone's first, someone's second, someone's third, and we make a line. So the entire class, like the first grade, second grade, third grade, you make a line, right? So first grade is here, second grade is here, third grade is here, and we all make lines in elementary school. And what they would do is they would call people's names. Who's first, who's second, who's third. And there was one kid, Rahim Nurani, I still remember his name, imagine that. He was always first, and I was second. Wow. Rahim Nurani. And I remember one time, I broke his teeth. I punched him in the face because I couldn't, I couldn't live with his shit face smirk, right? He would have, and the guy was super nice. 
He was a nice dude. He didn't mean anything. But one time I remember in class, he had this shit smile, right? This punk smile. And I just punched him in the teeth without any control. Just punched him. And he went to the bathroom and, you know, he was bleeding from his teeth and so on and so forth. And, and, and you know, and, and I, he was still first. I was still second. It didn't change anything. <laughs> right. Right. And so that delayed gratification of sort of not doing the pleasurable things, but studying. Right. That studying is hard, man. That's hard. Sitting down and focusing. Mm -hmm is hard and when i see other people working like a dj or at cafes or i see people you know my, my 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 colleagues or or even like my my family and i'm like the amount of work that i'm doing to delay gratification st still today there is no way i can imagine someone else doing that much work but then there is right you you go to the new york public library and I've been there many times when I used to live there. I would walk in, everyone's studying. Everybody. Young, old, boy, girl. Like everyone is studying hard. Same thing happens at MIT. right? Places like MIT and Princeton and these universities and Cambridge and Oxford. Everyone is studying. So if you have the gene to delay gratification, you still got to be in the environment. To have that gene turn on. And what's really interesting is all those men, and you know, the myth one that you just said, all those men that are having this cortisol spike because they are chasing, 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 increasing their head count and fucking as many girls as they can, that will epigenetically change their. DNA sequence, it'll change that because the ability to turn on and off genes called methylation and demethylation, this can change through your behavior in life. So this will have an impact on their sperm, which will have an impact on their future kids, right? So I would say, yes, delay gratification, yes, the myth number one, you know, have a bond with someone and love someone. Because you also, when you try to sleep with as many girls as you can, you're also treating yourself as superficial. You're treating your own body as something superficial, something to be used. So when you are trying to get as many women as possible, you are treating the world as a number, as something superficial. You're not going in depth and that will translate back into you. You will not see yourself deeply. You will not see the love and connection and the universal spirit in your human soul. You won't see it. And so, man, totally. Anyway, myth three. Makes sense. Myth man. three, yeah. Makes sense. I also want to mention that you yeah, mentioned please. people working together. And I found something that I learned the other day called body dumbling. Melissa told me about this where you actually are able to work better around people. It's a clinical. A lot of people who are neurodivergent work better when they're body doubling. And it doesn't have to be work. It can also be tasks around the house. It can be anything where you're in an environment of someone else is working and you can piggyback off of that working environment to just be in a place of focus and connection. And it's fun. It's fun to like call your friends and just kind of work together because you're both doing it. So you have that other sense. Some people use it because it gives them a sense of accountability. Some people just need to see someone else work in order to set off their genetics to be focused. But I think that's lovely. And that comes into play with being able to connect to doing something and feeling good about doing something. Because sometimes people don't like to do things and it just doesn't feel good to them. And sometimes they're just not motivated and sometimes they just aren't doing something they want to be doing. But who are we to figure that out, right? It takes a lot of self-awareness to know the difference between the two, which is always tough to figure out. But then myth three, I think, is important for this because it comes to terms with these feelings and building your emotional IQ, your emotional intelligence. And as a man, the big myth is 
don't have emotions. You hide your emotions, withhold your emotions. Or the other end of the spectrum, men emotion bomb their partners. And their partners are their sponge for everything. They don't share anything. All Their partners get everything. They either give their partner the cold shoulder or they use their partner as their therapist in their life. So that is myth number three is that emotions are bad for men. Emotions aren't bad for men. A lack of community and support for those emotions is what's bad for men. And that's where the men's work comes in, the men's groups, the being able to express yourself around fellow men who you can have that conversation with, who you can express these feelings with. Hey, man, I'm not feeling motivated at all. Hey, man, I don't like what I'm doing. Or I don't feel like this is something that is beneficial or this could be like bad for me. This person could be bad for me. My wife did something or my partner did something that triggered me. I got triggered the other day at the gym with these people and this thing happened to me. Having that community where you can express those feelings and not have to run through them in your head or push them away because you're afraid of what they would, what they cause and what they mean is so masculine. It's so primal in nature. Men gathering on a, around a fire, discussing these things, discussing their, their truths with each other and hugging their brothers, right? For nothing other than pure compassion. They think feminine means you need to be with a woman. You need to share with a woman. Or therapy, you need to go and you need to spit out all your problems on this one person and expect them to give you all these solutions. It's, it's more of a support system. It's more of a community that you build in order to get better as a man and challenge yourself, but also learn from men. Learn from men in your community who have, who have wisdom, who have gone through something similar, who are younger or older than you, and be able to share that. You can talk about the woman in your life. You can talk about things that you need to work on more. You can cry with these men. There's no judgment. There's just pure expression. And you're not using your partner as a sponge if you're already doing that with your partner because your partner wants you to take care of them too. You want to be able to facilitate that. But in order for, to facilitate that, full expression of emotion you need to be able to understand your own emotion and express your own emotion you can't fix or be there to support someone when your emotions aren't able to support itself so having that community having that group of people that you can express yourself with and you don't need to give them all your dirty dark secrets sometimes you can i'm just an open book with things i'll tell people everything I go through my whole story and all the shadows and all the things that i shouldn't share with people but I do it anyway because it's important for me and I think it might help others as well who are going through the same thing because it's common and we aren't aware of that being as common because we don't share as men and men are told that emotions are bad. And yeah, maybe you shouldn't be crying every day, crying yourself to sleep every day, but maybe you should talk about it if you do and figure out why you're crying yourself to sleep every day because having that sense of, of fear and anxiety and anger and anguish is so confusing as a man. There's no textbook for it. There's no guideline for it. You learn from your parents a lot, but sometimes your parents don't express those things either. And they need to support you. You know, Your dad is supposed to be the father for you, father figure for you in a lot of your childhood. So if he came to you being super emotional, then how are you supposed to feel like you can you know, be a, have someone stable to rely on when you can't? Or if your dad's shut off to emotions, how are you supposed to trust them and open up to them? Because they're shut off to those things. And how are you supposed to have that with your parents? So being able to develop that sense of community is very masculine and being able to open up without trying to impress your friends or without trying to impress that community. And sometimes you don't trust people. That's okay. You can talk about that too. That can be part of your emotional expression. Be like, hey, I have a lot of things going on right now, but I don't trust everyone here. And I don't want to share those things. That's part of your expression. That's becoming emotional and learning about your emotional IQ and building your emotional intelligence. Instead of doing the conventional man, which unfortunately in this day and age, and I think that's been very common, is men will, you know, drink. And that's their, that's their way of dealing with things. They'll drink and now they'll smoke and they'll use that as a, as a crutch to process those emotions and to forget those emotions or to just push those emotions down so that they aren't bothering them in the back of their head anymore. So myth number three is that emotions are bad for men. And you shouldn't feel them and you should push them away. Or you should be an emotion faucet and just open your emotions and be super feminine. Because that is popular too. And that's not what you should be doing either. You have to have a healthy relationship with those emotions. Got it. 
Jameson, thank you so much. <laughs> It's been an amazing, amazing uh, conversation. Uh, I still have probably, I don't know, 25 more questions to ask you. <laughs> but uh, a lot of the stuff I didn't get into because uh, things were happening, very interesting yeah. stuff. So we will continue in the next episode. But I wanted to ask you if people want to reach out to you or they want to find you somehow or send you a, a message and, and, and connect with you and share love with you. What's the best way to do that? Best way to reach me would be either see me in person and connect and ask. I can share my phone information. I love getting to know people locally and creating community. And then of course, I'm also at Jameson Camden on Instagram. And then I also create a lot of content at Afro D Health on Instagram as well. And then Afro D YouTube channel is where I post the most and share the most about what I'm currently learning about, interested in, and wanting to share with the world. So at Jameson Camden and getting to know me personally is the best way to reach me and contact me. And then at Afro D Health and the Afro D YouTube channel are the best ways to see my creations and what I'm currently working on. Okay. Thank you so much, Jameson. And that's the show today. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate you. Okay. Much love.